Well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism Podcast. I'm your host, Robert Ballum, and today we have a returning guest, Josh Gailey. Uh, Josh appeared just about a month ago, episode number 20, where we discussed his book, Witnessing Miracles, Historical Evidence for the Resurrection and Book of Mormon. Um, On the show notes, I'll include a link to the Amazon page. Uh, Be sure to check out that episode as well. It was a very fun episode. We went through the minimum facts theory for the resurrection and how to transpose that to the coming forward of the Book of Mormon and its uh, authenticity and so forth. And just on the Book of Mormon, a recent book has come out, a Dictionary of Proper Names and Foreign Words in the Book of Mormon, edited by Ricks et al. This book has been uh, in the um, pipeline, if you will, for a number of years. Um, it's been released by Interpreter and Eborn Books. My copy arrived today and it's almost read already. Um, I was very giddy about it, so if you're looking for a good bu- recent book on the Book of Mormon, uh, that's a very good volume for uh, you nerds who listen to this podcast. So uh, with that as the introduction, um, on Sunday, Amanda Brown and a couple of others will be discussing uh, women in the scriptures, so that'll be a very fun episode as well. And hopefully later this month, we will be discussing uh, abortion uh, with Nathaniel Givens, a um, controversial topic, but a topic that needs to be discussed in uh, more um, LDS and other circles. So um, be sure to be on the outlook for that particular episode as well. Um, to give your spoiler, we'll be taking the very staunch pro-life uh, position because there's no other position you should take. <laughs> but, Amen. Uh, w- yeah, thank you. See, ecumenism in work here. But uh, <laughs> Josh, of course, as you may remember from the previous episode, is not a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but he's a member of a group in the broad Mormon restorationist perspective, the Church of Jesus Christ, which sometimes known as the Bickernites, um, the third largest group in the Mormon restoration. And the second verse is to take the Book of Mormon seriously. Uh, Josh, welcome to uh, the podcast again. It's great to have you on again. Thanks, Robert. I, I really enjoy being together. I, I It's nice to uh, grow uh, our friendship base, our knowledge base, and just learn from each other. Look forward to talking about my church with you today. As I do and as I get started and as we interact, you know, I, I just want to come forth with humility. You know, we're a little church with big claims, but as I put forth those big claims and as I you know, at different times, I've worn the hat of apologist with you. You know, if I wear the hat of evangelist today and I get excited about my church, it's because I love my church. I'm so blessed and filled with the spirit in where I am and also respect tremendously where you are. And so I know we can come together today and have a great conversation. I appreciate being with you today. Oh, thanks. And I appreciate our friendship and our interactions as well. Uh, this actually continues a series of episodes I'm hoping to have on other groups from the Mormon Restorationist perspective. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we actually had a very fun discussion with a member of the Church of the Elijah Message, um, who's also an apostle and elder in the church, Adam Stokes, who I hope to have on again to discuss his work on um, Moses 7 in the Pearl of Great Price and hopefully have a friendly debate on modalism. Uh, he holds a position that modalism is the Christology one finds in the Book of Mormon in the 32 First Vision account. So um, that'll be a fun uh, discussion. And hopefully I will have a independent fundamentalist on in the next few months or next few weeks to discuss um, his flavor of fundamentalism. Uh, we've had two episodes critiquing fundamentalism. So I think um, just out of intellectual honesty and integrity, we should actually have someone on the other side as well to give their uh, perspective, even if we disagree. So um, as I said, uh, Josh is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ, not to be confused with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and perhaps he could explain the name and other issues later. But uh, Josh, uh, maybe give us some background as to um, your history in the church. Have you always been a member of this particular group? Um, and if so, how many generations um, have been associated with the uh, group? Yeah, thank you. I, I've born and raised, blessed in the church as a as an infant. Uh and that's one of the ordinances of the church. We bless our our children and our babies. And I, I've been born and raised in the church. And uh, thank God, I'm sixth generation in the church. Uh, my lineage goes back to the William Bickerton era. Um, my probably great 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 uh, grandfather was William Cadman, who was the president after William Bickerton, and they were close friends for much of their lives. So. Uh, uh, my history goes way back in the restoration down to, to kind of the organization of our church in the 1850s. And so that's, that's my background and, and been born and raised in the church. The church of Jesus Christ is headquartered in Monongahela, Pennsylvania. So we're out of Pennsylvania as our headquarters. And today we're about 25,000 members. We're a little over, we're probably going to cross the threshold to 30,000 soon. And, 
you know, we we are a, a growing and expanding restoration church on a much smaller scale than yours, my friend, but we're on a, a growing and expanding restoration church that has its footprint in 25 countries right now, and that continues to grow and expand. We opened up Cuba uh, this last year. We're continuing to open up new territories, and wherever there's somebody that's interested in the gospel of Christ that we carry, we are are desirous and willing to evangelize and share that good news of our Lord and his gospel restored back upon the earth. So our church is a small little engine that's growing and expanding, and I'm thrilled to be a part of it. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, so, of course, like we both belong to, like, say, the broadly speaking, the Mormon restorationist movement, and there's like a number of denominations or groups within that kind of uh, sphere. It's like the term Christianity. There's particular denominations as well. So, of course, we have a shared history. So perhaps uh, for those who may never have heard of the group or may have only heard of it in passing, you know, uh, what do you, to uh, up to what level is there a shared history? And perhaps you could discuss also the uh, historical pints of diversions. Yeah, so we both would trace our history to the angel that flew in the midst of heaven and the fulfillment of that promise to the Apostle John in Revelations 14, 6, and 7. And so we trace our history all the way to the New Testament church. We consider us to be the succession of the church established by Christ in Palestine. We would equally believe with a Latter-day Saint member that there was an apostasy of that gospel from the earth, and that in the latter days, God restored his church through an angel laying hands upon Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery. And I'll quote from my head here, I'll quote Oliver Cowdery's recounting of that when he wrote to W.W. W. Phelps, and he said, upon you, my fellow servants, in the name of Messiah, I bestow this priesthood and this authority, which should remain upon the earth that the sons of Levi might yet offer up an offering unto righteousness. And we see the, the, the ministry of Christ reinstated at that time and the church set up. And so we believe that we are the continuation of that church upon the earth today. So we both trace our history back to the angel. Now, the then the natural follow-up, okay, what happened? Why aren't we the same church today, right? I mean, that's the, the logical next question. And we follow our lineage. So where you might see a break is essentially in two points. I'll lay out the historical first. Okay, so the historical split for us between our organizations happens at the death of Joseph Smith. Okay, so when Joseph Smith is martyred and he's killed, Sidney Rigdon was running for vice president uh, with Joseph running for president. And so you can't live in the same state. So he's actually in Pennsylvania at the time. And when word of Joseph's death came out, Sidney returned to Nauvoo and essentially made his pitch to be guardian and continue the church forward at the time. And there's a lot of history we could get into, but actually, Robert, would you mind if I, if I made the pro Rigdon pitch? Um, yeah. So, so for, for Sydney, you know, we know his health was in decline. We know he wasn't well. Okay. But he's the, at the time of Joseph Smith's death, he's the only surviving member of the church presidency which was the administrative arm of the church overseeing the, the overseeing arm of the church ever since Kirtland. Okay. So even in Kirtland, Joseph Smith laid his hands on Sydney and in the prayer spoke that if, if Joseph was ever absent, that Sydney would preside over the church and you don't get much more absent than dead. All right. And, um, if you look at the even the legal documents for the churches at the time that, you know, and, and I know here I'm staking my claim and I know there's a different position here on the table. That's fine. But, you know, if you would look at the actual paperwork, the, the presidency was the one with their signatures on it. And so it would have been Sydney would have had a real good claim for actually all church property had he ever wanted to go down the legal route. Now, actually, in 1836, Joseph Smith reconfirmed in published now today through the Joseph Smith papers, published minutes of the church, that the church presidency, and I'll, I'll actually get into this. It says, uh, 
the 12 apostles, this is 1836 from Joseph, the 12 apostles are not subject to any other than the first presidency, viz. myself, and he goes on to include Sidney Rigdon and the other members of the presidency of the time in 1836. So for us as an organization, um, when our church president passes away, the, the presidency does not dissolve. Okay, that institution remains intact. And like most organizations today, when a president dies, where one of the vice chairman or vice presidents or counselors then would inherit that position until there could be a vote at the general conference. So we do that as a church. We do not dissolve our presidency when a president dies. The first counselor automatically goes into that place to oversee the church. And then we would vote and elect that at, at an upcoming conference. It's not an automatically inherited position to be president. It's something that our minister uh, selects every two years. And so that's definitely not what was happening in 1836, but we have the roots of that in 1836 and, and beyond. So we, we would tie ourselves to that with Sidney Rigdon. And, but while that may be the historical break that we would look at together if we were looking at this from a, a history of the Restoration. There's something that happens a lot earlier that's pretty telling that might be a spiritual way. We look at things that might be a little different. In 18, I think this is happening in 1830, Robert, but you may jump in and I'm pretty sure it's 18th, summer of 1830 some of the Whitmers start having experiences, okay? And there was a different seer stone, right, being used at the time, and there was a little controversy. And at the same time, Kirtland is starting and growing, okay? So Joseph is actually in Ohio, and the Cowdries and the Whitmers and some of the early faithful are still in New York. And some experiences are happening in New York. And we don't know necessarily what they were. We don't have a copy of what that was. But essentially, Joseph goes back to New York, convinces that group that, no, those revelations aren't from God. And, and he kind of rallies everybody and gets everybody to move west for the most part. I mean, Josiah Stoll stays back. Some other members stay back. But for the most part, the group then moves west uh, to Kirtland. But something happens at that conference in September 1830, and a revelation is passed and approved that basically says revelation from this point on can only come from Joseph Smith. He's the spokesman. And I think for, I, I don't want to speak for you, you know, for a Latter-day Saint, though, that is viewed, and I read it. I mean, uh, Dirk, Matt, and McKay did a great job covering this in their book, From Darkness Unto Light. And they did a great job presenting it from a Latter-day Saint perspective. It was very faithful to that. And I, I really enjoyed reading that. And it was presented in a way of, you see, here's the calling and the fulfillment of our prophet for our day and time. We would look at that and, and hesitate and say, whoa, 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 that limited the voice of God to one man. And that's at risk of the failure of that one man versus the bigger body of the church. So we'll get into more of this spiritual difference. We have topics about revelation that I know are on your docket, but it, there's something that happens way there early that when we would read it today as a church member in, in my church, we would go, whoa, you're limiting God's voice to one person. The check and balance system can then get out of whack. All Satan has to do is deceive one. Okay. Whether or not he was deceived, that's almost not even the point. You know, but if you limit it to one voice, then it can go down the track of that one man versus if revelation can come through the church as a whole, then you have a check and balance system. So that's our perspective, at least how we would view that. There's almost this spiritual change where you can look at those 14 years of restoration and see it as a progression towards enlightenment if you're a Latter-day Saint, or you could see it as a regression back towards apostasy from which it came. And that might be more the perspective of the Church of Jesus Christ. Right or wrong, that's how we might view that. So, no, thanks for that. You also touched upon some differences of ecclesiology and uh, other issues as well. So that, that's pretty important. So um, in advance, I actually sent Josh a list of maybe topics or questions like uh, maybe to discuss. Some of them 
uh, you can go long, you can go short. It's not, uh, but I'm no like, um, as I said, nerds like myself and normies who are wondering about uh, the so-called picker and light movement will actually have these graphs, and so it's probably good to um, have someone who's informed and has a very good background to the two groups. Um, uh, I know you're not LDS, but you've had interactions who will be uh, positive with uh, other LDS as well. Um, uh, so many uh, friends, many have joined my podcast, many yeah. have, like we have common family. belief in yep. historicity of the mm -hmm. Book of Mormon. There's so many things that link us together, and I have valued every interview and every interaction. So I, I hope, even though I'm being bold in my claims today, that good. that doesn't upset the apple cart. I, no, no, I, no. no. Um, if anything, at least uh, some LDS will be more educated about the, the um, different groups without uh, out there, yeah. which is always good. Um, so uh, the first thing will be, of course, the role and status of Joseph Smith in the Church of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, you would accept Joseph as a divine inspired prophet like LDS would. Uh, so... However, like if you, uh, a while ago I was listening to um, uh, Daniel Stone and his uh, interview on the Gospel Tangents. Um, oh, good. Page. Yeah. Um, he, and by the way, for those listening, uh, Stone wrote a very good biography. It's the only biography I'm aware of, but it's a very good uh, biography published by Signature Books on uh, William Pickerton. So uh, it, that would be probably a very good book to get on uh, th the topic. But be as me, um, who, so for you, um, one of the things he was bringing up, though, is like, Joseph is accepted as a prophet, but like at least some members in some group in uh, churches win the movement. He's there, but he's not really like uh, he's maybe given, for lack of a better term, short shrift at times. So, what uh, what would be the status of Joseph Smith for like um, in the church? Of course, he's a prophet. Do you believe he was always a prophet? Do you believe like as some groups do, he may have become a fallen prophet or close to a fallen prophet? Um, how would you view the role and status of Joseph Smith? Yeah, I think this is maybe one of the most important questions we could tackle. It's so good that it's early because it does help distinguish where the Church of Jesus Christ is compared to different groups within the Restoration Movement. Okay, so when we look at Joseph Smith, we see the Lord using him in tremendous, marvelous ways, right? I'm holding in my hands our mini version of, of the Book of Mormon, all right? I, I got the mini version in my hand today. And we see, even on what Joseph himself said was from the last leaf of the golden plates on the what is today the title page of the Book of Mormon, we see Moroni basically stating that it was sealed by his hand, sealed by Moroni's hand, this record, and hid up unto the Lord to come forth in due time by way of Gentile, the interpretation thereof by the gift of God. So we view Joseph Smith as that Gentile, as the one who was used to bring forth this record and clearly had the gift of seer to be able to translate this ancient record by the gift and power of God. And we honor and recognize him as God's vessel to do that. And he and Oliver together, when hands were laid on them to begin the church and restore the priesthood back upon the earth, wonderful, marvelous things that God did through him. But we also recognize that he's a man, and we would not put him in a category of infallibility, but that he would be somebody that was a sinner in need of a savior. And if you go to the earliest, you know, the unpublished early version of his first vision, that's really where you find Joseph in that writing is somebody who's convicted by his sins, who's promised by the Lord that his sins are forgiven. He has this incredible, you know, conversion experience to Christ. And it's beautiful. The, the first vision as it's recorded that way, I find just, just incredible and, and very touching to me. But, you know, we do not view him necessarily as the choice seer spoken of in 2 Nephi chapter 3. We look forward prophetically to a choice seer to come through the indigenous people of the Americas that will be used by God. And this is going to sound ring in the ears of people who have read some of David Whitmer's writings. We have very similar belief and interpretation of 2 Nephi 3 there, where the traditional LDS interpretation of that would be, well, that, that was Joseph, okay, Joseph Smith. 
we read that a little differently, and we believe that Joseph was, in fact, a Gentile. So the last shall be first, the first shall be last. So the gospel could be restored to the Gentiles. And then when we look at 2 Nephi 3, we see a promise of a great deliverer that will be used unto the convincing of the whole house of Israel that Jesus is the Christ. And we look forward to that deliverer to come, even as it's spoken of in Romans, the 11th chapter. So we would not put Joseph within that text prophetically and that interpretation. And we we don't believe every revelation he had was necessarily from God. In fact, there's probably several that we would we would reject and and our position would be just not being substantiated by the um by the Bible or Book of Mormon. The example I might give on this that runs in my mind, just as we're kind of laying it out, is when Joseph requests to send people up to Canada to sell the copyright of the Book of Mormon. Initially, there's pushback. Basically, we're not going except the Lord tells us. So a, a very convenient revelation comes that, yes, you should go, go up there. This is God's will. They go up there. The copyright is not sold. It is a relatively unsuccessful trip. And when they come back, another revelation comes forth that basically says some revelations are from God. Some revelations are from the devil and some revelations are from our own mind. And so we need discernment when we look at the experiences from God. And there's some times where we feel like maybe within those 14 years of the restoration movement, there were times when maybe some revelations were accepted that we might feel might not have been from the Lord. Okay. And with respect to um, Joseph, uh, although you would call like, maybe call into Carson some of these revelations, 1830 to 1844, do you believe he did die still as a prophet, albeit um, with some questionable issues, or do you believe he was a fallen prophet just prior to 1844, like uh, David Whitmer's view? You'll hear both in the church. So, uh, you, so it's you'll, you'll hear both. Position. Yeah, yeah. And I might lean more towards the first, you know, others might lean more towards the second, but uh, you'll you'll hear both within the church, yeah. I'm muted. <laughs> but for those who are listening, maybe a good book to actually pursue would be the 1887 book uh, by David Whitmer, an address to all believers in Christ. For two reasons. One, it will give some background to like uh, some of the issues and beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ, um, if you do have yeah. any influence from David Whitmer. Secondly, although he uh, complains about Brigham at all in the opening few chapters, and we discussed this last month, um, yeah. he basically affirms the plates, the angel, and so forth. He's a witness of the Book of Mormon and so forth. So in spite of like some of the issues he would ha later have with Joseph and Brigham and others as well, um, it's basically like, oh yeah, yeah, um, I can't stand those guys. But at the same time, Joseph told the truth, the Book of Mormon is true. Uh, get used to it. Basically, that's a TLD or so. Um, it's very good because um, in spite of all the antagonism he did feel um, at the time, uh, he still affirms his uh, testimony of the Book of Mormon. And um, as we discussed last month, uh, that's a very strong witness, regardless of where whatever you will say about some of these issues theologically and scripturally with some topics, some which I'm sure will come up now. Um, I think we can both agree that's a very strong witness of the Book of Mormon. <laughs> so, um, I think yeah, and for that. for people that are like waist deep in the restoration, and they hear me say this, it may sound really strange because of Sidney Rigdon's position in the church and revelations that certainly he was a part of and supported and brought in that that we wouldn't even support today. So we even honor Rigdon for the position he held, for the ecclesiastical position and the structure of the church that he held at that time. And so we honor that. But there's a lot of things that Rigdon believed and promoted that are not in the Church of Jesus Christ headquartered in Monongahela, Pennsylvania today. So what's interesting is as after the death and, and Rigdon takes a small group that was with him, goes back to the Pittsburgh area and begins to preach and tries to set up like a Zionic type, you know, tries to repeat some of the things from that they'd done in the past. You know, that group really splinters and doesn't do very well and fractures to the point of William Bickerton, who had joined that church, essentially finding himself alone, you know, with a small, small group. And 
the Lord, we believe, gave him instruction and commandment and revelation to preach the gospel and continue on. But so when you think of, well, how could the Church of Jesus Christ today follow Rigdon from a church structure standpoint, but not from maybe some of the revelations and things that he was a part of? Well, we almost look at us, and you'll hear this preached and taught within the church, that we would view, like Isaiah says, that that there's a new wine found within the cluster. Okay, and so we believe that the Church of Jesus Christ, when it says that in Isaiah 65, that that cluster is being spoken of as the restoration, and that the Church of Jesus Christ is that new wine, okay, within that group. And so, you know, we believe William Bickerton was used in incredible ways by God, but it was almost like a fresh start for the restoration built solely on the tenets of the Bible and Book of Mormon. So we recognize Sidney Rigdon's authority and his lineage of history, but we see a recovery back and we mirror, we're probably, we we look a lot more like the fledgling church in New York than we do Nauvoo as a church. Okay. We look a lot more like this small, uneducated group of farmers and school teachers in New York than we do this very developed and expanded upon city of Nauvoo that was bringing people in from Europe and was having this great evangelistic success. My church looks closer to New York than it does Nauvoo, if you were examining the two. And for a lot of reasons, we're then we're founded by a bunch of uneducated coal miners. But it's like, okay, they knew the Bible and Book of Mormon were, were true. They were commanded by God to go forth and preach the gospel. And the Church of Jesus Christ today is the product of that ministry and that outreach, if that makes sense. It does. Um, now, you just make sure I'm not you. Uh, you basically have touched upon like Cindy Rigdon, but like any other comments about the role and status of Cindy Rigdon? Um, and also, you mentioned William Bickerton. So if you want to also like, um, What's his status? What's his role? You mentioned he received revelations. Perhaps if you were to give like a uh, general overview of um, William Bickerton and his importance and maybe um, to the uh, movement as well. Yeah, without without William Bickerton, we're not here. There's there's probably no question to that. I don't think that the Church of Jesus Christ would exist without William Bickerton. And what kind of happens there and and when the Pittsburgh group is fracturing and fizzling and Sydney eventually moves back with family in New York. And it, this all kind of transpires and from the ashes of that little group, you know, William Bickerton feels very alone and actually something kind of funny happens. It, so now we're in the 1850s, right? when this is all being discussed, well, missionaries from Iowa come, LDS missionaries from Iowa come to Pittsburgh. And it's part of the rally cry of we're all, we're all the same. Let's, you know, join up. And, you know, William Bickerton at the time asks very directly about polygamy because part of what Sidney Rigdon at the time was accusing of was polygamy in the church. And he was, Rigdon was staunch against that. Okay, and Bickerton came up through that, okay, accusation of what was going on out West, but he'd never been out West. William Bickerton was an Englishman who was living in Pittsburgh and working in the coal mines. He'd never been out West, so he didn't know. So the according to William Bickerton, the missionaries from Iowa said, no, there's no polygamy. Come on. So William and the small group of saints in West Elizabeth got baptized. OK, they, you know, technically joined the church all right, at that time. Well, just a short time afterwards, the public declaration of polygamy happens. OK, and when that happens, the small group from West Elizabeth formally met and excommunicated every member from the, the Western church. OK, so it was like the, it's like the audacity of that. Right. But as. But it was so important at the time, and it shows the distinction, okay, of where, what Rigdon, when he was going out to Pittsburgh, he was very anti-polygamy, okay, in his sermons, in his writings, in his rhetoric, all right? And William Bickerton was definitely in that mentality, and our church definitely from that mentality, okay, where where we would not 
ever practice polygamy. That would be a big controversial item for us. Uh, just a different interpretation of scripture and so on. So, but yeah, so then, you know, when he's then found by himself because the Western church accepts polygamy and William Pickerton doesn't know what to do then, the Lord gives him an experience. And he was placed in a vision on top of a mountain alone. And before him was a great chasm. And the Lord instructed him that he needed to preach the gospel in purity and truth is how he found it, or he would be cast into the chasm. And so he went forward, as he even writes in his own writings, he says, I went forward on faith and began to preach the gospel. And some heard and some obeyed and, and were baptized. And, and that's the really the expansion moment when our kind of organizer at that time is evangelistically used by the Lord to expand this work. And he recognizes that he might be alone, but he has everything he needs from the Lord in the Bible and Book of Mormon to go forward and preach the gospel. So there's a, a kind of a, a core experience for the founding and organization of our church. As the church grew, we accept revelation from brothers and sisters. There was revelation about ordaining the 12. There was revelation about the, the structure that we have, and that goes on. But that's kind of a, a core experience from the early beginnings for us. No, that's good. Um, okay. And of course, there's Daniel Stone's book on William Pickerton. So if anyone wants to like say delve deeply into him uh, and his history, um, I think that would be a very good resource um, for one to pursue. It was published by Signature Books only a couple of years ago. Um, okay, so uh, some of these uh, you can go long or you can go short, but like I have a uh, series of questions, as you know, or series of issues. Yeah. So uh, maybe the first one will be uh, the status of the Bible. Um, so. Um, I'm guessing um, the church uses the King James, but of course it's not the King James only. So what is the role and status of, say, the Bible, um, the understanding of the Old and New Testament, and of course, like, uh, modern translations and their allowance in the uh, group and so forth? So uh, if you want to, like, uh, maybe just address that uh, first. Sure. Bible is scripture to us, and we have a very high view of scripture. So, uh, so... You know, we do use King James. We don't use the uh, Joseph Smith translation of the Bible at all. We would use the King James version in our buildings. And obviously people, when they're studying at home, use different versions for understanding and references and just just to to be able to get different contexts and, and different ways to understand the text. But, you know, in the in the church, King James version, and it's it's the word of God to us. Not not infallible. Okay. Uh, I guess, you know, to dive into what may be a question behind the question, it's not, we don't believe the, the Bible to have be free from human error, mistakes in editing. Um, so that certainly happened historically over time. And why should we not understand that that happened? But we believe there's a core inspiration to it and it is scripture and the word of God for us. Uh, that's fine. And uh, you mentioned you don't, of course, use the uh, JST. So um, what would the understanding of the JST be? Would it be like um, how some LDS view it, like, say, a useful tool and so forth? Or is it just, um, for lack of a better term, and take this in the way it's meant to be, um, maybe give it yeah. short shrift? Or uh, is it yeah. just seen as a historical curiosity, like some LDS would view the lectures in fate, for instance? Historical curiosity, for sure, um, for some, but it would never be used in... Most members, I'm assuming, I'll say this, I don't think I have one on the shelf. I, I don't think that hardly any of our members would, so. No, that's fine. Um, and in terms of preaching, of course, like, uh, it would not be unusual if someone were to use, say, the NRSV or something like that, but normatively, um, of course, it's the King James Um yeah, and, preaching, and preaching, and teaching books. just the King James. You'll just see the King James used. Yeah, and of course, like, um, well, in in the LDS tradition, we have what's uh, section ninety three that kind of says uh, some pretty positive things about the Apocrypha, like a uh, you know basically the seven standalone books in the Catholic canon. Um, you know, the TL uh, to give it in the abbreviated version, like uh, there could, some of it may have been inspired, some of it is not. So, like, uh, read uh, 
as long as you're influenced by the spirit. Um, of course, like you don't accept, well, you don't have the doctrine of confidence in your canon, but at the same time, would it be like, uh, when it comes to say outside sources like the Apocrypha or the Pseudepigrapha, not necessarily like in a preaching context, but like would the church actually view like um, even at a secondary or tertiary level, like the importance, of, like say some of these intertestamental and other sources? Yeah, it's, it's not viewed as scripture. We don't use the Apocrypha as scripture, but even William Cadman, our, sec our president after William Bickerton, in some of his writings refers to historical value and spiritual value within some of the apocryphal writings. I cited Maccabees for historical value in my book, you know, in regarding some of the, you know, so it, it certainly is something that is, is not completely foreign. It's just not something you would see preached from or taught from or, or used in any way as, as the same as we would the standard Hebrew Bible, the standard old Testament, that we have and the, the New Testament or and the Book of Mormon. So for us, for us, it's the Bible and Book of Mormon, man. That's what we have. That's what we're, that's what we use. And for us, from Ezekiel 37, it's one in our hand, right? It it's the Bible and Book of Mormon are the scriptures that we have, no other. And for us, they intertwine and interlock. And you might as well take both books and and thread them together and weave them together they are preached from in every sermon they're taught from in every lesson so and that's perfect because that kind of goes into the next two points i'm going to ask um so the status of the book of mormon uh of course you accept the book of mormon so uh which printing is used to use the same versification and chapter divisions as lds used post 1879 with orson pratt um Maybe if you were to address uh, the issue of uh, Book of Mormon historicity, I hate the fact it has to be addressed, but like there's a certain group uh, that's not as uh, that's bigger than you, but not as big as us. Uh, hint at that. That's yeah. given short trip. So maybe if you were to address like the the importance of historicity, something I think we can both amen uh, to. But also like uh, how the Bible and Book of Mormon are used, um, as you said, like uh, you, for you it's the Bible and Book of Mormon, man. So uh, how they're used together, you know, uh, yeah. in terms of exegesis and maybe other issues as well. So, um, sure. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, so here's something fun. This was my great, great grandfather's Book of Mormon. Okay. So it's, we titled it at the time when we did one of our first printings, the Nephite records, right? So that's what we called it then. Um, but we all know what it was. All right. And it, it's, uh, this one he signed um, April 1913. So we didn't actually print our own. We were a poor church, man, and we were small. So we did not print our own until the turn of into the 20th. Okay, so right around then was when we print our, our first Book of Mormon. And so we used the versification system that, that we knew, which would have been the LDS versification, and we use the text that was available at the time. So we probably closely, not perfectly, but closely match like the whatever version was the LDS version in the late 1800s is probably what got absorbed. And, you know, don't sue us, but probably was uh, we just ran with it, man. We printed our own version from that text. But with that being said, I love the work of the earliest, I mean, this is a tangent, but I love the critical text project and everything Royal Skousen has done in, and I believe we should be seeking the original text as it came forth. There have been changes. We want to, you know, we want the original. We want the words as they were given by God through his incredible gift uh, to Joseph Smith at the time. And so, um, yeah, I, by, um, if I'm missing something or if I'm, Answer the wrong way. So, so our version probably closely matches yours from the late 1800s, and versification matches. Um, I I personally wish we could all just match. I mean, it would be so much easier. This is what the, I, and there's three that I know of too, right? Because with some of the fellowship groups, they have their own Book of Mormon now, and so with some of Denver Snuffers, some of those fellowships and the fellowship groups, they have their own versification. And it's different from our RLDS too. So when I wrote the book, I had in footnotes both the RLDS and the restored edition, uh, the restoration edition, so that anybody that read the book could, you know, 
cross-reference with their own text that they had in front of them. I, I wish we could, that seems like a silly thing to be divided on. I mean, there's Bible verses that aren't in the right spot to start the verse or end the chapter, but I'm not going to change it for me. You know, let's all, let's all have the same versification. That's my plug. Let's all, let's all have the same verses, but uh, uh, the, it is everything we do is built from the Bible and book of Mormon. And that's, you know, we're not going to be found as a church, our, my church being found, being built on any of the revelations that came through uh, the, uh, what would have been the book of commandments and later, you know, in 1835, the doctrine and covenants. And then from, from there on some of that expansion, you know, we, we won't use that as scripture. It's not found in our churches. It's not something that's really discussed much. What you will find is a very simple church built on the core basics of the Bible and Book of Mormon, and that's our foundation, and that that's kind of where we're we're built from, and and very very strong on his. I think you mentioned historicity. The Book of Mormon's historical, and we believe it's historical. And if you don't believe it's historical, we're probably not the right church for you. You know, it, it the Book of Mormon is a true history of ancient Israelites and the Jaredites also, but it, it's a, we believe it to be historical. We believe there was a real Nephi. And if you don't believe that we're probably, we're probably the wrong church. And Josh, you're going to, you said some things I take, take exception with. You're probably going to take, uh, say some things I'm also going to take exception with, but let me just say uh, a hearty and I'm really ever ecumenical amen to that. So, yeah, uh, yep. yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. I know we have differences here. I respect the fact that you can let me answer Robert. And I know there's, you're, you're super brilliant. And I know there's a part of you that is, is, is biting the bit, right? Because you want, you know, you have answers and you have your position. Thank you for letting me just share who we are. I appreciate that very much. Well, I wouldn't have you on if you uh, said uh, it's okay to reject Book of Mormon historicity. I just, <laughs> for me, um, unfortunately, there's like, uh, I, I hope it's not the case in your group, but like, unfortunately, there's like uh, certain people, including a uh, well known TikToker, I'm not going to name names, but we all know who I'm talking about, that seems to reject uh, wholesale Book of Mormon historicity. And for me, um, well, I do believe like the boat should be big enough as, but um, to allow like differing opinions, like say where the Book of Mormon took place. It took place in most America, but if you want to think otherwise, feel free to. Uh, but when it comes to say, rejecting Book of Mormon historicity, that has implications. And, reg you know, and the TLD or version is like when it comes to the plates and so forth, I believe Joseph told the truth. Now, I, I know that's not politically correct position. I know it's seen as wacky, but I don't care. And yeah. in spite of yeah. like, some misgivings you might have with Joseph post and journey about certain issues, I'm sure you would agree. Like, uh, if he wasn't being honest about the uh, plates um, throughout the entire thing, it's worthless. You know, so, they, um, yeah. So, yeah. Um, the core and, miracle of the restoration. It's, it's like rejecting the resurrection. It is like rejecting the resurrection. Yep. The witness to the truth of the restoration movement is the Book of Mormon. And we would both agree with that, right? It is the testimony that comes forth. And it is comparable, very comparable to the resurrection. So if, you know, if there is no Book of Mormon, our churches don't exist. So the, you have to accept the core foundations of the coming forth. We might disagree very quickly on what happens after, but neither of us exist without that beginning. So, yeah, and I think we can both agree in spite of our theological differences, functionally at least, it's around heresy to claim to be, to hold to um, a fictional Book of Mormon because. And for those who want a good yeah. essay, my friend Stephen Smoot uh, has an essay on the imperative for a historical Book of Mormon on Interpreter. Uh, it was published by the journal. Uh, it kind of goes through like the uh, problems of it because you have to explain the plates, you have to explain the witnesses, you have to explain the angel. All the while, I have more respect for someone who would just say they reject the Book of Mormon and leave the church as opposed to, you can still believe it's uh, nonsense, but like it's allegorical, you know, uh, basically the community of Christ position these days. Um, so yeah, I heard you amen to that. So um, I'll yep. let you continue anyway. Uh, maybe like if you were to see like how the Bible and the Book of Mormon are used to interpret one another, you know, um, a la the two sticks um, approach uh, that you were mentioning. Yeah. So in Ezekiel 37, you know, we hold to a very traditional restoration interpretation of that scripture, of that chapter. 
which obviously has prophetic utterance towards the uniting of the kingdoms and the gathering in the house of Israel. But at the core, there's a scripture there that basically says, take one stick, write upon it for Judah and the house of Israel and his companions. Take another stick, write upon it for Ephraim. So for the house of Joseph, his companions, put them together. They will become one in mine hand, speaking the Lord's hand and, and our hand today. And so for us, that is part of the prophecy of why we would say that today we want to use two books and not more. Okay, so I, I actually we would look at Ezekiel 37 and say, well, there's prophetically two here. And in the Book of Mormon, there's prophecies of other records that will come forth. And so we look forward to other records yet to come. And today for us, it's the Bible and the Book of Mormon, one in our hand used for doctrine, for interpretation, for understanding, for our structure of the church. It's all grounded in scriptures that you find in the New Testament and in the in the Book of Mormon for structure and ordinances of the church. That's good. And um, of course, like I really doubt the uh, church actually has an official position on the geography of the Book of Mormon, but like at the majority position, at least those who have studied it in the LDS tradition would hold to some limited geography and more than likely a Mesoamerican setting, including like uh, the Mormon's Codex book that you have there and the other works of... Um, uh, Frank Garner and others, and I know that you would hold to some form of Mesoamerican thesis as well. Is that like the predominant view of uh, those in your community who have stud studied the issue, or is there like a um, more preference for like say a South American model or a North American model? I would, I do uphold a Mesoamerican model. I, I think it's the the model that is the most palatable. It's not perfect, but it is it is way. I think, in my personal opinion, light years ahead uh, of some of the other models for for foundational reasons, writing systems, and just you know the basic structure of the text and and laying it out. So, our church as a whole is not we are not geographers. Okay, we are not uh, people that have dived into the apologetics as much as other organizations. And so I think for the majority of our membership, I don't speak for everybody. And where I fail here, even on this interview, I, I plead the, the Mormon and Moroni cry of where there's faults, you know, where I make mistakes, forgive me, you know, but I, I don't speak for everybody. I think people that have looked into it definitely lean towards Central America. I, I don't think there's a division on this within the church at all. I would say for most people, the exact location is a curiosity, not something that they, they're looking at the Book of Mormon and gleaning out all the spiritual content. And the, the geography is a nice bonus. And so they'll listen to me talk about it, but it, it may not be where their focus is. They're reading out of Alma and reading about Captain Moroni for all the spiritual good that's there and where it happened, it happened somewhere. They may not know exactly where, and that's okay for, the, for most of our membership. You know, we as believe as, it happened somewhere. It took place somewhere. You know, exactly. Like and, and we do, and they do. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, I'm kind of an, a, a nerd within the organization where I really like to study that out and have a firm opinion on it. And, but I'm, I'm probably not, I'm probably more the exception on that. Um, well, like, like I am here. So it's, it's all good. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that's, uh, that's a good brief overview of say the uh, position of the Bible and Book of Mormon and the tradition. Um, one friend of mine, Spencer Krause, he was on like a few days ago to discuss the Son of Solomon. Uh, he wanted me to ask you a question based on the Doctrine and Covenants, but I'll also good. include the Book of Abraham. So Joseph did claim, uh, after the Book of Mormon to receive what we would call public revelation, I'll say private revelation, but public revelation. And, you know, um, we have a bunch of them in my tradition called the Doctrine and Covenants. So um, from someone who believes Joseph to be a prophet, um, um, while, the, of course, the Doctrine and Covenants are not accepted, uh, what do you do with Joseph's revelations, uh, including these public revelations? Um, now, I know, like, there's a reject, um, I believe that some of them are not true revelations or at least binding. Yeah. But like um, to give an analogous, um, Adam Stokes, who was on a few weeks ago to discuss the Church of Elijah message, canonically they don't accept the Book of Moses, but it's an allowable position to 
view the Book of Moses as inspired or even use it. Um, so would that be in a position where like one could appeal, like say certain post ancient charity revelation of Joseph, at least uh, as substantiation or what do you do with these revelations? Now I know like um, you may have to, um, you might take exception with some of them. So like um, generally what would you do and uh, so forth. And also maybe if you were to discuss also the book of Abraham, because Joseph did claim to have translated them, do you believe it to be, not a true revelation? Do you believe it was like a secular translation attempt? Uh, what would you, uh, how would you view the uh, Book of Abram as well? So um, I know there are two pretty uh, lengthy questions, but like s take as long as you want with them. Yeah, I'll, I'll do my best here. And, you know, in general though, the, just to speak for the church for a moment, you know, you're not going to find it in the church and the church generally is not going to be teaching from those revelations at all. You might see them being referenced historically, like when there's a revelation to go West and preach and Oliver goes with Peter Whitmer. And you might see that tied into a lesson somewhere. I, I have done that before where you're showing, okay, here was the command. And then they went. It, it's not that we don't feel that some of them were from the Lord but we definitely don't try and parse that out as a church. Okay. So one thing I've witnessed is for some groups that have broken off over time, one of the challenges they face is to decipher within the DNC what might be from the Lord and what's not. So you get like the, the fellowship groups, they have their own version, right? And they're some things have been eliminated and excuse me, I hit the mic. Uh, some things have been eliminated and other things. And they're, they're trying to sift through that history and, and decide what's from the Lord. Okay. And I've, I've seen multiple groups do that. There's, there's multiple different versions of the DNC that exist. And we just, we just don't try and do that. So for us, it's, it's a very much so a fresh start from William Bickerton on we do accept public revelation and, but, but to your questions. Okay. So for the book of Abraham, I, I personally don't accept the book of Abraham. I, I don't believe that that was an inspired translation. And I, I don't believe in several of the revelations that were happening at that time. Our church would hold a similar position. You won't see them being used at all in the church. And for the average member, the question you just asked, it's almost not relevant. Now, I'm not saying it's not a relevant question. I just mean it may not be a relevant question for th the average member of our church. It just wouldn't even come up. Um, but with that said, you also asked something different to say, well, is there a place in the pew for somebody that might accept this revelation or that revelation within the grouping? I'd say probably yes, as long as it's not contradicting our faith and doctrine. Okay, so we have a, a faith and doctrine that's not going to change, that's very set. And it's built on the Bible and Book of Mormon for those scriptures. So to your question of could somebody essentially be a member of our church and hold on to one of those revelations and view it as inspired of God? Well, as long as it's not contradicting anything in our faith and doctrine that we uphold, I don't think that's an issue, okay? Okay. But our church isn't go isn't today trying to take a stand on on one or the other or sift through that. So, for better or worse, Spencer, you may not like that answer, but that's my answer, and and there it is. So I we just don't even make the attempt. Um, there is room in the pews for somebody that accepts some of those revelations as long as they aren't contradicting our our core tenets of of faith. And of course, like um, a distinction that seems to be like not just unique to LDS, but other groups as well, at least there's a distinction between something necessarily being inspired and whether it's canonical. There could be many things that are inspired, like the missing books of the Bible, the books that are to comfort with respect to the gold plates. But of course, they're not canonical. So like uh, there is like um, when the broad Mormon uh, spectrum, if you will, there's some uh, wiggle room when it comes to these things that Protestants and Catholics tend not to have. So uh, I think that's important as well. Yeah, true. And I, I very highly personally, I'll just share, per, this is now me with just the Josh hat on. I, I love the book of commandments. Okay. Love those early revelations 
I, I view them with great respect in what God was doing in that early period of time. So, you know, there you go. No, thanks for that. Um, as I said, like, uh, Pardon me, it's like jumping just to respond by the same time. Yeah, uh, yeah. I hear you. I hear you, man. Yeah. M- maybe maybe you can do a party where we have a friendly dialogue about some of the differences, but, you know, I'll, I'll be nice. I like you. So, uh, okay. So I appreciate that. I think yeah. you could probably tear me up and down. I know you're smarter than me, so well, I, I would you, lose the you, debate. You've always, so. you've always been nice to me, so I would, in spite of being Irish, I'd uh, try my best. To, uh, <laughs> well, I, you're, I got some roots there, man. Gailey's pronounced that way for a reason. So oh, that's, no, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, okay, so that kind of fact covers like uh, the view of the Doctrine and Covenants and uh, Book of Abraham. So, with respect to the Church, and this will touch upon some aspects of, of which we'll address later of ecclesiology, uh, I, the fancy term for the theology of the Church. Uh, is there a belief in ongoing, not simply private revelation, but like public revelation and respect and res- related to that? Well, when it comes to not necessarily the public sphere, but also the private sphere, is there a belief or an allowance for what's called continuationism, i.e. the continuation of these spiritual gifts, like speaking in tongues, the interpretation of tongues, and so forth, something that you do see in the early restoration. So is there a belief in uh, these uh, gifts as well? Yes, absolutely. And the first place we have to go to, to get our understanding now, now it'll be, okay, well, what's uh, on Revelation? The Book of Mormon is very clear. In Jacob chapter 4, verse 8, it says, How great and marvelous are the works of the Lord! How unsearchable are the depths of the mysteries of him! It's impossible that man should find out all his ways. No man knoweth of his ways, save it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God. So we don't despise the revelations of God. We believe in continuing revelation. We accept revelation that comes through from the priesthood. We believe revelation can come from anybody. Uh, it, frankly, Pharaoh received a revelation in the book of Genesis, and Joseph was used to interpret that revelation, and it had impact for the people that were in Egypt at the time. So we believe that God is a, is a God who can speak to anybody, whomsoever he will, wherever he will, at whatever time we will, and I will not muzzle that voice as God speaks. And then as a church, what we accept then is what's brought before the the priesthood, and then we review and we seek confirmation in the spirit of something, whether or not it is from the Lord, and we do accept and publish revelation. We accepted two in April, and we believe in the gift of, to your question, we are a um, I guess the the word from the world would be charismatic, but we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. You know, we have the gift of tongues and interpretation in our meetings. My daughter, Phoebe, was born with a genetic disorder last April, and she was anointed and healed. So we believe in the healings of God. She's no longer deficient in what she was deficient in. She's been healed by Christ. And so we have the gifts. I have ordained a brother in Portuguese. I don't speak Portuguese, but I've had the gift of tongues. And we uh, are in our church. The dead are raised in our meetings. The sick are healed. The lame walk. The blind receive their sight. And uh, God is blessing and inspiring the church of Jesus Christ in marvelous ways. It is, we are nothing. We are nobody. We are an unimportant blip in the eyes of the world. But God has been so good and merciful to us as a people, and his gifts thrive in the church of Jesus Christ, and I praise God for that. Uh, thanks for sharing that. Um, and I'll keep your daughter in my prayers, by the way, uh, for continuing. Oh, she's healed. She's good. Oh, good. But thank, we'll take the prayers. Oh, yeah. But well, she yeah. is healed. Oh, yeah. no, that's good. Good. Um, yeah. Well, I'll keep her in my prayers in case, uh, anyway, uh, but Amen. Happy, happy to hear that. So a um, couple of questions are relating to that. Um, so when it comes to, say, your regular Sunday to Sunday meetings, um, now, the, continu- the belief in continuationism, and that's a fancy term for those listening for, like, the continuation of the spiritual gifts after the death of the apostles, uh, that's something that actually both our traditions would hold to, like it's in the Articles yeah. of Faith and so forth. So, But for us LDS, uh, the typical sacrament meeting is very... Um, uh, very, I hate using this term, but it's very uh, low church present. So, like, uh, it's a it's a very low liturgy. There's no speaking in tongues and so forth. That's usually seen as like 
outside the Sunday sign, if you will. Um, would your church um, be uh, like that, or would your like the typical Sunday services be? And when I use this term, I'm not trying to engage in guilt by association, but for lack of a better term, more Pentecostal at times. Yeah, so we would we would not like the direct connection of saying, "Well, this is the Pentecostal." Yeah, as I, I said, except. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Except if you're saying that we carry the spirit of the church that was established in the day of Pentecost. Okay. Yeah. So, but do we have the gifts active in our meetings? Yes. Okay. Our sermons are not pre planned. I do not pre plan my sermon out, but I preach just about every Sunday. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is uh, not something that's written down. We uh, are very free flowing in that and seek God's inspiration and direction and, and guidance on. Uh, the gift of tongues can come forth in a meeting. We seek interpretation for that when we when we have it. And so, you know, as far as as that goes, we would view the spirit that we carry as a unique gift from the Lord to our church. We would not view necessarily the Pentecostal meeting as representing the same thing as us, per se. Okay, but if it's just a blanket question of do we believe in the gifts and, and do they happen in our meetings, that answer is... Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, to be, um, I, I, again, I was a little hesitant, but like for the yeah. term, like you yeah. think Pentecostal mean you think like speaking in tongues on the regular Sunday. So um, it may not happen every Sunday, but, but it does. But happen. it's something that's yeah. It would not yeah. be unusual for that to happen. C correct. Okay. Correct. And for for communion, it's a great topic because you know we're kind of unique in how we operate that way. First, we do it every Sunday, which I know is not necessarily totally unique, but we we share a common cup, so. We, in fact, during COVID, this got, this was something that was starting to be discussed and a revelation came forth to the church. We had a, a minister who was praying about the common cup. His wife, like my wife, works in the healthcare system, works in the hospital, high exposure, and essentially not wanting to expose any of our elderly members, right? You know, and just that concern and love for our people was prayerfully petitioning the Lord about the common cup. And so, and for us, it's bread and wine. We use bread and wine. It doesn't matter whether you're in Africa or whether you're in the U.S., we use bread and wine. And so he was praying about that. He had a dream that was accepted by the church as a revelation from the Lord. In the dream, he's sitting next to his wife. They're getting ready to pass sacrament. He has all these concerns. And then he sees the Lord standing next to him. And it was like all those concerns that he had, it was like the Lord could hear them, even though he wasn't voicing them. And the Lord was pacifying it all. And when the ministry uh, knelt down to pray for the wine, the Lord walked up to be with the ministry up front. And then the Lord walked with the ministry to each member in the dream. And as each member partook of the cup, the Lord touched the rim and put his finger around the rim of the cup. And the brother in the dream could see all the impurities from the lips that were on the cup. And each time the Lord would touch the rim, it was cleansed and made clean and brought forth. So we accepted that as a revelation. Common cup is here to stay. That's part of our church. That's who we are. Yeah, and also, like, uh, I know, like, for some modern LDS, that might seem a bit odd that you use a common cup, but that was actually the practice for a number of decades, even amongst us uh, Brighamites. Uh, yeah, so yeah, it was. Like, that's yeah. correct. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's not unusual. And there's, like, precedence, like, uh, in the New Testament, it was clearly a common cup that was used at Corinth and at the Last Supper. So it, it might seem, like, for those outside, very unusual, but especially for 19th century groups, not just when the Mormon Restorationist group, but some, like, broke off from Campbell, Campbell's um, uh, group as well, like Chris Delphians and some others, they use a just a uh, the same uh, cup as well for all the um, participants in the uh, Eucharist or the sacrament meeting. So, um, just with respect, and, to and we can we can enjoy the Lord's Supper anytime, and we do it every Sunday for mm -hmm. sure. But um, this last Wednesday, our, our ministry and my local congregation, my local branch in Erie, we we felt we. We had a fifth Wednesday of the month. Each one kind of has scheduled for different things. The fifth Wednesday is a little open. Sometimes we do a prayer meeting. Sometimes we do something different. And we just, we felt to have a, a prayer session and, and enjoy the Lord's Supper together. So it it's not restricted to Sundays necessarily, although it certainly happens every Sunday. So Yeah, that's good. 
Um, and there's like a few other questions about baptism and the uh, Lord's Supper we'll address momentarily, but that uh, right. kind of uh, will save some initial legwork anyway. So when it comes to, say, the nature of church and the use of fancy term uh, ecclesiology, um, but on the local and global level, what are the uh, what's the leadership of the church? You know, uh, would you have like apostles? Would you have elders or bishops and overseers? And also, like one of the key distinctives be- uh, or differences, I should say, between our two traditions is, I believe you have one, not two priesthoods, and you don't Correct. have in the New Covenant era, um, following David Whitmer, you would not have the office of high priest. Uh, so maybe if you were to address those, I'm sure you're familiar with, like, say. Um, the common LDS uh, views and your views as well. So maybe if you were to discuss why there's differences. And also, what priesthood is it? Is it what we would call the Aaronic priesthood? And if so, what about Joseph's claims of receiving the Melchizedek priesthood? Or do you believe that's a later um, uh, digression, if you will, from God's order, if you will? Yeah, these are all good questions. And if you're working your way through the restoration, we got to ask these and talk about them, right? So it's it's all good. Our structure of the church is we have 12 apostles, Today, our church presidency comes from within the 12. We do not have a presidency separate from the 12. That is a change from the early Restoration Church. And even the earliest days of our church, that's a change. But we, we for about 100-some years now, we have 12 apostles, and our church presidency comes from within the Quorum of 12. Okay, And then we have 70 evangelists a quorum of 70, one singular quorum of 70, who, you know, we take the commission of Luke chapter 10 very seriously to preach the gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And that is the evangelistic call. I am ordained as a minister unto that office, unto the Lord. And we have elders or ministers or pastors. We call them elders, but those are all the same, you know, same term for us that are part of the priesthood. And so that's that's the, the priesthood of Christ for us that have the authority to administer the ordinances of the gospel. All right. And then we also have within the ministry teachers who do not have the authority to uh, anoint or to bless the sacrament or, you know, and so we have ordained teachers within our church and we have deacons and we have ordained deaconesses as well. So where do we get that? Where do we get our structure? The fourth article of our faith and doctrine explicitly says that the structure of our church is built after the New Testament church. And so we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we look at Ephesians chapter 4, and we look at the New Testament model that you find in the Gospels. So we clearly have apostles, we have the ministry, we have teachers, and we see in Acts chapter 6 the office of a deacon, and we see in in uh, Romans chapter 16, the office of a deaconess being attributed to Phoebe. And we also recognize that in the Greek, that's the same word. So it's the same office, just with different responsibilities. And so we uh, have those ordained offices as well. The deacons and deaconesses officiate over a lot of the natural affairs of the church. It's not necessarily an ecclesiastical office. It's much more, I mean, it is a spiritual office, but it it really is um, an oversight over a lot of the natural affairs of the church and the building and and so on. And so it, we have a presiding elder in our locals that is elected, okay? And it can be elected from any of the local ministry that might be ordained who are there. We believe that that these ordinations are a calling from God. They're not necessarily at a set age or a set time. But that through the revelation of God, speaking of revelation, that God would reveal the calling to the ministry about individuals that might be ordained or or called to a certain office. And we seek the Lord's inspiration on those things as the body. And so uh, the Quorum of Twelve administer over the church, the Quorum of Seventy evangelize the church, and the Quorum of Twelve participate in that as well. And within our locals, we have uh, elders that are overseeing. We call them presiding elders. They are the uh, you know the officiating officer. The New Testament word there certainly might be bishop. They're the overseer. We wouldn't call them that, but they're the overseer over that congregation. We have areas of the country and of the world broken up into kind of regions or countries or sectors. And from that, there's administrative bodies that oversee that as well. So 
Um, that's and the most important calling in the Church of Jesus Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're the president or whether you're newly baptized. Hands down, and you'll hear every member of the church say the most important calling is the calling to be a member, the calling to have your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Everything else is is more responsibility from the Lord, praise God, but we're called unto Christ. There's no sweeter call. It, it's it's the best one of all. So, okay, now that's that's a good overview of like the offices and so forth. So, um, of course, like one of the differences, or like one of the many differences, of course, like uh, would be um, you only have one, not two priesthoods. So, uh, yep. would that be what we LDS would call the Aaronic priesthood? And maybe if you were to address like why you don't have the office of high priest in the new yeah. in an in a new covenant era. Yeah, sure. Um, when we read Alma 13, and it talks about the high priesthood, it talks about the high priesthood being after an order. And the high priesthood being discussed there is after the order of the Son. So we believe that the priesthood that was restored on May 15th, 1829, was the priesthood of Christ the priesthood of Jesus Christ, and he is our high priest, and it, this priesthood is after his order, and it's an everlasting, it's an eternal priesthood without beginning or end. So we take Alma 13. When I read these verses in Alma 13, if you'll uh, just bear with me. You know, it says, being called unto this holy calling, ordained unto the high priesthood of the holy order of God, to teach his commandments unto the children of men, that they might enter into his rest. This high priesthood being after the order of his son, which order was from the foundation of the world, world, or in other words, without beginning, beginning of days or end of years, being prepared from eternity to all eternity, according to his foreknowledge of all things. Now they were ordained after this manner, being called with a holy calling and ordained with a holy ordinance, and taking upon them the high priesthood of the holy order, which calling and ordinance and high priesthood is without beginning or end. That's what we believe was restored to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery that day on May 15th. And so when we talk about Aaronic, well, frankly, I believe that the priests in the days of Moses and Aaron carried the priesthood of Christ. It was just from a different era of time. I believe Melchizedek had the priesthood of Christ just from a different era of time. We do not necessarily layer the priesthood. I I feel like this is some of these questions get awkward because then I if I dive into the why, I know I'm putting I know I'm like muzzling you because I know you're gonna want to respond. Well, I wouldn't okay. have invited you on otherwise. Right? Yeah. I think so, I've been doing a good job melting myself so far, so it's okay. You're doing awesome. I can't believe it. I'm way. I'm waiting for you to go. But Josh, you know this, this. Maybe but, if we do know, a part two, as I said, like I, I consider <laughs> you a friend. I like you, so uh, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, so I mean, when you look at something happens interesting in 1831 in Kirtland, and it's written in rough stone and rolling. Bushman accounts for it, and it's the discussion of the initiation of the high priesthood, a higher priesthood. And when that takes place, the two people that are first ordained, it's almost like they're possessed. It's not a very comforting moment. And I, I say that, I hesitate because of, you know, just what that might imply or different things. But we don't view the later additions of priesthood as necessarily being something that was inspired. We believe there's one priesthood. We believe there was always one priesthood. And when Hiram is at the other end of the room shouting to Joseph, saying, Joseph, Joseph, this is not of God. I will not believe it. I will not believe it. It's probably because there wasn't a good spirit in the room when it happened. And so we would look at that moment when the high, higher priesthood was added unto the church as something that didn't need added. What When we're looking about the priesthood being restored, it's prophesied of in Revelation 16, 7. And for us, it's the moment when the angel is called from God, from Christ, to leave the heavens and come to earth and restore the priesthood. And it, the priesthood was something that had left the earth through apostasy. It needed to come back to the earth through revelation and through the laying on of hands of the angel. 
Christ set it up, man lost it, Christ had to command it back. And so, you know, we we wouldn't view a a, a, a group's addition to it as something that was necessary. Again, I know I'm saying things that you disagree with, my friend. So, but there it is. And you're doing a great job. God bless you. So, and, and would that inform why you don't have the office of a high, high priest, or would you also throw in the fact that high priesthood was an Old Testament or Old Covenant uh, concept that some often hear as well? Yeah, you, you'll definitely hear some people say that. I, my point is, I, I just don't see if we're if our structure is patterned as our fourth article says after the New Testament church, it's not something that you see unless it's being spoken of from the the Jewish community. So it's. It's just not something that we find in the New Testament era of the church, and it's not something that we find in the third Nephi era of the church being spoken of. Now, an absence of evidence is not always ev evidence of absence, but if we're patterning ourselves after that that church, it, it's not something that we see. Uh, we would view ourselves as priests after the order of the Son of God in the office of elder or, you know, whatever. So, and basically, the TLDR version for those listening in would be for you, Aaronic and Melchizedek priesthood, if you will, are numerically one and the same. There's no distinction, if you will, between the priest that Aaron had and, say, the priest of Melchizedek that's spoken of in Hebrews that Christ has. Uh, there might be different offices, but in terms of, say, priesthood, you would disagree with us that there's, although all priests, of course, is like derived from God and so forth, that we still yeah. have like a numerical distinction, if you will, between Aaronic or Davidical priesthood and Melchizedek priesthood. You would not have that numerical distinction. You would claim Aaronic priesthood is Melchizedek priesthood, if you will. Correct. Yeah. S said well. Yeah. No, that's perfect. So we're going to go on to like a, uh, on the listing, uh, the history of race relations in the church. Now, um, I'm, I'm pretty open about this on the blog and so forth. I, uh, I, for instance, as you know, like from 1852 to 1978, um, TLDR, as a, a result of like um, 19th century Protestantism being Mormonized, there was like a strand of um, very poor race relations in the church in terms of the temple and priest restriction. And for those who want a very good book on this, uh, Russell Stevenson's book, For the Cause of Righteousness, A History of Blacks and Mormons from 1830 to 2013, would be probably one of the best books to get. It's a very good documentary history. So, of course, like, for in the 19th century, there was some racism, unfortunately, from all groups. But, like, was there ever any major um, history of uh, poor race relations in the church in uh, for your particular group, as there would be for, like, say, the um, so-called Brigamites and so forth? Yeah, it's. I think that we can all say that any organization that existed in the 1900s was imperfect on this, right? So we, I'm sure... If you go somewhere in our history, there's going to be issues. But I will just say this, that I'm blessed at how my church reacted to those issues. We ordained blacks in the priesthood in the 1800s. Anybody, any elder that disagreed, and we actually did this, elders that disagreed with that and disagreed with the full integration of races in our membership were they they lost the priesthood they were no longer allowed to be active and we took an uncompromising position against the Ku Klux Klan at the height of its powers we had elders that were white that lived down south that were threatened by the Ku Klux Klan because they were preaching the gospel to blacks and they stood strong, and we have congregations down south today because of their efforts. We have uh, a our brother Penn was ordained into the quorum of twelve apostles in like 1904. So we had a black apostle as early as 1904. We have brother Jim Crudup today is a black apostle, African American apostle today. And we have uh, wonderful brothers and sisters. And frankly, the majority of our church is black or, or African or African-American. That's our probably 60% of our church is either from Africa or African-American. So it's a, they, uh, you know, although in my congregation, uh, we're probably 50-50, half are refugees from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the other half are, are uh, you know, are Caucasian, 
but I think the standard here that's set is set in the Book of Mormon. It's in Second Nephi chapter 26. And Second Nephi chapter 26, verse 33, it says, He invited them all to come unto him and partake of his goodness. And he denieth none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and free, female. And he remembereth the heathen. And all are alike unto God, both Jew and Gentile. I believe I'm Gentile. I believe that I'm only here because I'm adopted in through the grace and mercies of Christ into his kingdom on the earth. And I thank God that while I'm sure there have been moments and I know our church is not perfect, I thank God that we have set a great standard for the church across its history um, I know even when some of the uh, Black Lives Matter movement was just getting started, our church, you know, did a lot of effort to reach out to our minority brothers and sisters in the church to talk to them, allow them to have a voice to talk and to share things that they've experienced so that we could grow together and grow closer to each other. And hopefully, if we're all growing closer to the Lord, we are growing closer to each other and create a platform where everybody had a voice to express difficulties, to learn. And that continues today. And, and we're not perfect today, but may the Lord perfect us towards that goal. Yeah, thanks for that. And I'm going to say something that will probably uh, annoy some people in my camp, but I wish our church actually had the uh, spine to have done something like that. Uh, whenever I discuss like, the priesthood and temple restriction, I always try to situate in the 19th century, but one thing I will never do is try to defend it. I mean, uh, yeah. if you if you yeah. want to look at the example of prophetic fallibility and then some, I would just say, look at the uh, temple and priesthood restriction. So, uh, yeah, so... <laughs> But uh, onto like uh, something else, and that's the nature of God and the Godhead. Now, um, so I believe it's fair to say like uh, your group um, would be binitarian. Um, would that be a good? Uh, okay, so um, yeah, I think that's fair. So we would view God the Father as having a a spiritual body. Okay, and and Christ the Son to be the express image of the Father in the flesh. And, you know, you tie in scriptures to the New Testament, you know, even when I say the express image, that's a New Testament phrase, right? Hebrews you know, you, you you find it interwoven here in there in, in our position. And then the Holy Spirit is the omnipotent, is the om omnipresent factor of God that allows him to be everywhere at all time. And what is that in Second Corinthians, in Corinthians, I think it's Second Corinthians if I'm remembering right, it's 2 Corinthians 2.16, but don't don't hold me on that. But it's where it says, well, Paul says, we have the mind of Christ. So what is the whole? It's the mind of the Father and the Son. And and so that's our, our view of the Godhead. Basically. In, in, in an imperfect way, trying to describe a perfect God who's infinite and eternal in two minutes. I mean, impossible, right? So, so it would basically be the theology one finds in the fifth lecture in faith. Um, would that would that be correct? Um, probably, probably fair, fair on, and and we would even love some of the early articles that Oliver Cowdery wrote. I mean, those are awesome as well. I know it kind of transitioned quick away from that, but he basically quoted the Book of Mormon the whole way through, and it, it's yeah. So okay, and maybe like I'll just do briefly flesh some of these points out because I'm sure like some will be curious. Uh, when it comes to, say, the uh, Godhead, um, of course, like you believe that the Father is a person and the Son is a person, but you said that the Father is a, uh, a spirit. Um, yeah. And if your church has not gone into this depth, that's fine, but just out of curiosity, uh, when it comes to spirit, you know, like uh, in our tradition, uh, based on what section 131 and a few other teachings that are extra canonical, um, we don't believe spirit is immaterial. We believe spirit is a form of material. Um, so, would that be? Uh, would your group actually have a position of whether spirit is material or immaterial, or is that something that's just like we believe it's a spirit, but we don't haven't really uh, delved into um, nature like that? You're definitely walking down a path that, no matter how I answer it, it's going to be wrong. Okay, because we have not. If you're looking for a systematic theology of the church, we don't offer that today. That's fine. and so you would probably, you know, there's probably some very Molin, this is going to be a word nobody in my church will know, but Molinistic, you know, 
approaches to to some of these to to God okay is is something that we probably are leaning closer to than anything else but that that's me reading it out and studying it our basic beliefs are very simple we sure. we would probably err on the fact of it if i was to answer it today i'd probably say not material necessarily it, it's spiritual and but when i say that there's probably depths of theological meaning sure. to that that are beyond what i even know and you know christ certainly resurrected in some incredible material and spiritual form and that is very evident and that's what we one day will receive in the resurrected body so we're heading towards that way you know even if and but god the father you probably wouldn't see us describing him in that that same way no, okay that's fine uh with respect to the father though um you probably don't believe he has a body like Christ does or like how LDS correct the father. but do yes. you believe that he's spirit if you will do you believe that has tre dimension and form like the pre-mortal spirit of Christ um do you believe yeah. like, basically God the father is still even if you don't believe he's embodied do you still believe correct. that he's uh he, he has the appearance of a man he's three-dimensional and so forth like how we would view the spirit anyway uh, regardless as, of as far as we can understand and read yes I mean Stephen is getting stoned to death and he sees the throne of God and Christ sitting at his right hand. Lehi has a similar type of experience. Alma has a similar type of experience. There, there certainly seems to be a form that we are the created image of. And, you so, know, so LDS um, and um, your group as well, we would more or less agree when it comes to say, say Genesis one and other texts that speak about the image and likeness. Yeah. There could be like a moral likeness, but, we would probably both agree primarily yeah. it's about a three-dimensional likeness if you will yeah our disagreement might be on the reverse button of how far back you go with that and then what that sure. means the implications of that the farther back you go for us god the father would be eternal and everlasting and never having been a, a you know a created being okay so for us he's He's eternal that way. Okay, so the reverse button, if we hit the reverse button, that might be where we find the the core differences here that that bring the nuances of these conversations out. Ba ba um, basically, certain interpretations of both the Cain Follett discourse and the Sermon in the Grove. Uh, correct. Yeah. Those two and, things we would reject, definitely. Yeah. And for those listening, um, hopefully I will have Blake Oster on in the near future where we will discuss our shared understanding of the King Follett Discourse and Sermon in the Grove. Uh, we don't believe uh, the traditional reading. So uh, I think that's something you might enjoy as well, Josh. But uh, yeah, I, yeah, I enjoy, I mean, I'm fascinated. I love the restoration movement. I love you, my brother. And I, I'm fascinated by, you know, the, the conversations and the depth and, and the theology. I'm fascinated by it. Yeah. Sure. And just on the uh, nature of Christ, um, you would believe that he did personally pre-exist, but also that he, he, would you believe also that he's eternal as well? It would not be like an, uh, an Aryan Christology. It would be similar to like an Elias Christology. Basically as a person, he eternally pre-existed. Uh, and then of course, like he emptied himself, became man, was resurrected and so forth. But you would believe and affirm the personal, the eternal personal pre-existence of the person of Jesus. Correct. Yeah, that's certainly true. And, you know, when, when you read the New Testament, I, I find just overwhelming evidence of Christ being the Yahweh of the Old Testament. It's not perfectly fleshed out in the Old Testament, but when you see all the quotes of the references of the New Testament that are quoting the Old Testament and then tying those attributes to Christ clearly as the express image of the Father, it is the Son doing a lot of those interactions of the Old Testament. If you work, if you're willing to, I mean, this is without the Book of Mormon, man, but just willing to look at the quotes from the New Testament, quoting the Old and attributing them to Christ, it seems to be a slam dunk case that certainly the New Testament followers certainly believe that Christ was the Yahweh of, he was the Hashem, you know, of, of the Old Testament. So, yeah, no, I would agree. The, uh, 
even the New Testament actually has a very high Christology. Like uh, even in Mark, yes. it's seen as a low Christology. Yeah, Mark fourteen, and Jesus claimed to be the Son of Man. Still there, yeah, still and there. And also, my uh, the express image that actually comes from Hebrews one, and in Hebrews one, you yep. have the most explicit affirmation of the personal preexistence, but also Jesus as the personal agent of Genesis creation in verses ten and twelve, where it quotes from a Yahweh or Jehovah text of Psalm one hundred two. Yeah. It's, and it's, we're very comfortable with that because I mean, in the Book of Mormon and the New Testament, Christ is the creator. He's the logos. He's the creator. You know, he's the one that creates the worlds in Colossians, in the Book of Mormon. You know, he he's the create. Now, how that works and how you flesh that out exactly is probably beyond my understanding. But clearly, Christ is the creator in the New Testament and in the Book of Mormon. So, OK, um, well. I'll actually ask these now, but I'll come back to the Holy Spirit in a moment. Yeah, good, good. Uh, when it comes to the creation, um, and again, maybe when it comes to the, the immaterial spirit team, you know, it's not something that's been fleshed out, and that's fine. Just say so. But would there be a view on creation of nothing and creation from pre-existing material? Because as you know, like, um, and loads of areas yeah. have written about this, uh, we would hold, based on, say, Section 93, Abraham Tree, and extra-canonically, the Kinfall of Discourse and so forth, that God did create, but he created... Ex, ex materia, and that's a fancy term from from pre existing material. Yep. But, yep. Um, the traditional Christian Jewish perspective would be ex nihilo, i.e., from nothing. So, would your church actually have a position on that, or would it be just like a neutral as long as you affirm God created? We would overwhelmingly probably affirm the latter. Okay, that it was it was from nothing, and you know, um, part of the, I mean, you know, one of the things that I was considering when when I saw this bullet from you was I was considering a couple Book of Mormon verses. Now, I again, I know you're in a helpless position. So I, I'm going to quote these and you're like, yeah, but I have an answer that I, I feel bad even. I Don't take what I'm doing the wrong way. Always. I'm coming in in a spirit of love. But I'm Irish. You know, I'm not easily offended. Don't worry. I can tell. I just I even feel bad for the audience. I know your audience is overwhelmingly LDS and they're going to be sitting there like, when to throw tomatoes at Josh. Like, no, no, listen, this is just who we are, man. This is just, but, you know, when it talks in like, okay, like Mosiah, you know, the son of all things created all things, heaven and earth, that gets into some of the stuff that we were talking about, you know, believe in God, believe that he is, believe he created all things, you know, without him was not anything made, which was made John 1, 3. So it, for me, in those verses, as I read those verses, I see the Lord creating everything. So then your question is, well, is it is it from nothing or is it from something? Well, if it's everything, to me, that means from nothing. Now, I know you. there's probably a depth in theology there that you can come back with, but that's just for me when I read it simply with my own simple mind. When it says Christ created everything, to me, that means everything. It means out of nothing, he made it all. You know, that's my simple mind at work when I read those verses. And, you know, even Adam, you know, Alma 1836, Alma 2213, it talks about the creation of Adam. First Nephi 511 says from the creation of Adam and Eve, you find it in Ether. Even even Moroni's plea in Moroni 103, you know, it it's speaking of the creation even back to Adam. So it I know. There's different ways to look at those verses, but I, to to me, it seems to support this creation out of nothing. That's my, that's my simple view and interpretation of those verses. I think that's overwhelmingly how we would feel as a church, you know. Um, yeah. Uh, well, all I'll say now is uh, my friend Blake Oster's essay out of Nottingham, A History of Creation Ex Nihilo in Early Christentile from 2005. Um, for those who want the other side of the kind when it comes to the yeah. passages Josh uh, just referenced. But, um, or go on my blog, I've discussed like uh, some Hebrew and Greek issues as well. So. Yep. But we'll leave that for a moment. Maybe maybe, <laughs> maybe maybe a part two or three, I don't know. But um, we'll address like the nature of man in a bit more detail. But would that mean, of course, that you would hold, say, the more traditional Christian view, if you will, that although Jesus did as a person pre-exist, everyone else did not personally pre-existed. They only were no Correct. mind and foreknowledge of God, what's basically called in theological circles, ideal pre-existence, but not personal pre-existence. Correct. Yeah, we would be very mainstream on that. 
Okay. No, that's fine. Um, and just with respect to the Holy Spirit. Um, so you would not view that the Holy Spirit is a third person, but um, you would view it as the um, the third mind, if you will, of both God and Je- God the Father and Jesus, and even based on the lectures in Fate Number 5, which I actually, for this uh, interview, reread last yep. night. Uh, the shared mind glorified Christians will have as well in the hereafter. But it's not a person, but it's still personal because it's God's um, spirit, if you will, spiritual presence and operating spirit, if you will. Would that be a correct um, yeah. assessment of uh, the pneumatology or theology of the spirit in your uh, tradition? Yeah, I think that's well said. And obviously the Holy Spirit can, can manifest itself in many forms. You know, obviously manifested itself as a form of a dove descending upon Christ at his baptism. So, you know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, I think you said it well, and, and it doesn't mean that it, you know, certainly the spirit appears to Nephi in Nephi's experience and, and has a form there. And then later, you know, there's almost, he calls it the angel. And then, well, is it something different? Is it the same thing? But, you know, I, I certainly the Holy spirit can appear and probably, a good way to explain that might even be, this might be oversimplifying it, but the many visions people have of the Lord, which I believe, whether you're in our church or not, that certainly come from God, you know, and and they might have those experiences. Well, it's may not actually be the risen Christ descending to earth and appearing, but the Holy Spirit can appear to somebody in the form of Christ and they could have that vision and, you know, and it'd be a very real experience. So that's, there's just a, a lot of the Holy Spirit creates a gateway for the Lord to do a lot of incredible things. Okay. So this kind of goes on. Um, let's begin with baptism. Uh, both our traditions would hold, I'm sure, like to baptism by immersion. Uh, that was a yes. hot button topic, even outside Mormonism in the restorationist movement, like Cindy Rigdon, before he became a Latter-day Saint, was a Campbellite. And they're very gung-ho about uh, baptism by immersion and immersion only, I'm sure. And that's the LDS view. I'm guessing that's the Church of Jesus Christ's view as well. Yeah, that's the meaning of the word baptism. Oh, right? yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. it means immerse. So we we practice that, and we practice that only in an open body of of natural water. It could be a pond, could be a, a lake or a river, uh, but we baptize in a in a natural body of water. Up here in Erie, Pennsylvania, when it's super cold, we chainsaw the end of the lake and we baptize in the lake. So it's um, that that's we do it by immersion. We do it in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and so, you know, so calling the, the candidate by name. Be, so the wording formula would actually be pretty similar. Pretty similar as the LDS, Ra- raising be, one hand yep. and then bringing it after and immersing them, you know, yeah. and, and bringing the candidate out. So and, and of course, like we, um, of course, we would both practice, you know, to use the technical term credo, not pedo baptism, i.e., believers' baptism, not infant baptism. Yes. Uh, yes. Is, I'm guessing you would also agree that there is a certain age or reason, if you will, like in the LDS tradition, all things being equal, of course, it's eight years of age. Would you have something similar to that as well in uh, your tradition? Yeah, it's it's not set. Okay, so we believe that that baptism is the ultimate covenant with God that we can make on this earth and that we, you know, the Lord has atoned for our sins and that, you know, he came to earth. We believe in that. If we believe in the gospel message and we repent of our sins. So what we would look for is actually the fruit of repentance on a candidate that would be of an age of accountability. So it wouldn't be a, a set time frame. The Really, the youngest we would ever go is probably about 12. There's no actual rule on this except to say that we believe in being of an age of accountability. There's nothing that that specifies that anymore, but we would really hesitate to go much younger than that. We, we really, we really don't in general. It's, and actually would encourage somebody that's being prayerful to make sure that they understand the lifelong covenant that they're promising to God and that they have truly experienced a, a sorrow for their sins and a fixed determination to, to serve the Lord. Similar and, to like uh, chapter six in Moroni, like, um, you know, you bring fruit. Absolutely. Uh, meet repentance and you're baptized. So yeah. um, if it's not too personal, how old were you when you were baptized? I was 13, not too personal okay. at all. Okay. Yeah, it was November, it was cold, and the Lord gave me a beautiful gift. We went into the water, and this is something that has stayed with me even in my ministry, which really surprised me because it was a blessing at the time. I did not expect it to be a blessing that continued on. But when we baptize, I could stand in the lake all day. 
it doesn't matter what I mean, I've baptized in nine degrees and I felt warm. I did not. The water doesn't. And I don't like getting in a cold pool. So this is like, you know, this isn't Josh, right? And, and by the this... way, for uh, Irish and UK listeners, he's not saying nine degrees Celsius. It's nine degrees Fahrenheit, which is on the minus scale for us. So... Neg negative what, 15 or something? Yeah, it, would, yeah. it would be something similar to that. Yeah. Pretty chilly. It's pretty chilly. So yeah. Yeah, it's negative Celsius. So, um, and and the Lord's blessed me where it it doesn't. Eat. I mean, we've had some marvelous experiences. You know, one had this gentleman that came to the church, met the Lord, and wanted to you know repented of his sins, wanted to make his covenant with the Lord. So, on a spring day in Erie, we went to the water, and it was a sleety, cold day. All right, and uh, Ninety percent chance of rain all day. It just was one, you know, and snow mixed in or whatever, and it was just a nasty day. Went out to the, uh, went out to the water, and raised my hand. And as soon as I raised my hand, the clouds parted, and a light illuminated us, and it was so bright it was almost supernatural. And we had first time visitors that were on the shoreline that Sunday that were just in awe. They were like, that was more than the sun. That was beyond the sun. And the, the brother Derek, when he went down, he could see even under the water and his eyes were closed. He felt the warmth of the light and the sun striking him, comes back out and we walk to the shores. We're walking to the shore, clouds close up, rains come back down. And it was a miserable day the rest of the day. We had 30 good seconds there from the Lord. Oh, thanks for sharing that. Um, and like in the LDS tradition and some other traditions when the uh, Brown Mormon Restorations Movement, uh, you might not use this term, and I know LDS don't, but like functionally the theology is there. It's called baptismal regeneration. Basically, God through the means or the instrument of baptism regenerates us, remits our sins, and forgives our sins. And there's other views as well, like say the historical Baptist views, like you should be baptized and it's a outward sign, but it doesn't affect salvation at all. So what would the Church of Jesus Christ's view of the effects, if you will, of water baptism be? Would you agree with LDS and others that it's the means, not the cause, but the means by which, you know, God's grace is initially applied and you're uh, born again and so forth? Or would were there be a view that it's a command, it's important, but it doesn't actually positively affect salvation, if you will? No, we, so... I, I don't want to minimize the fact that it is a command when you say that. So it's clearly a commandment in scripture, yeah. right? The, the People are pricked in their heart in Acts 19. What must we do? And the command comes, repent and be baptized. Repent in the Hebrew to turn away from your life and start a new life. And, the, you know, in Romans 6, we are buried with Christ in baptism Right. So we're crucified with Christ in that moment, buried in the tomb with him and come up truly a new creature. So I, I'm not sure that we feel that the water actually does any washing, but the re, it is very real to us at the same time. OK, it is it is the moment of covenant with the Lord. It is the moment of of symbolizing our conversion. Our testimonies surround about our asking for our baptism and the Lord's prompting us and prodding us to it. So it is the for us the pinnacle and the peak of our calling to Christ. And so, you know, I I I think we are in very much agreement here on this. And I may not be saying it perfectly, but it it is, you know, I don't read anywhere in the New Testament where somebody is wanting to join the church and baptism's not the requirement. Sure. where somebody's wanting to repent of their sins and baptism's not the answer. And so if we're matching our theology with the action of the book of Acts and the action of of the scriptures in 3rd Nephi, especially the 20s through 29, you know, baptism certainly seems qu quintessential to the faith, not just a nice to have, but a must have. And Basically, you would agree, like, God uses it as the means of bringing about a remission of sins, a la yeah. Acts 2.38 and so forth. Yeah, yeah. so, yeah we, yeah, we would be we would be in agreement. And I like the fact you bring up Romans 6, um, because, as you, as you know, like, it speaks about, like, us being united by Christ through, with, by baptism and so forth. What's rather interesting, you know, if you ever want to uh, discuss this as well, in verse 7, the King James, the 
verb translated as freed as a result of baptism is actually the verb decay out, which means to be justified. So you're justified, not simply freed from sin. Um, such a great, such a great thing to bring out. Amen. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah. Um, and for listeners, um, of course, like track down or ask for a PDF of my book, uh, Born of Water and the Spirit, the Biblical Evidence for Baptism and Regeneration. Um, this, this is a... Uh, I saw that and I know it's on my list to buy because when I'll, I saw I'll, that, I'll I thought I'll I really want to read it. I'll send you the PDF after this. You don't have to do that. I'm happy to support you. Oh, I'm no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll happy send you the PDF. Um, if anything, just a first search. I'll take it. Yeah, yeah I'll take that's it. That's good. I'll yeah. send you. But um, this is like a teaching that's, I think, even even if you didn't have the Book of Mormon, Modern Revelation, just with the Bible and the Bible alone, it's rather clear baptism is not simply a symbol or only a commandment. It's a, the instrumental yeah. cause, if you will, of remission of sins. But yeah, I'm glad we're uh, I'm glad we're in agreement on that particular topic. Yeah. <laughs> and Mosiah, uh, Mosiah 18 makes it, you know, you get into Mosiah, it's real clear with the waters of Mormon for it to be, you know, um, I don't think it's because they didn't have pools available. I know, I recognize that they're hiding you know, from the king at the time, but it is in an open body of water and it is for the remission of sins. If you look at verse seven there in that chapter, you know, so I, I think there's a lot there in, in at the waters of Mormon that highlight what we're talking about here. No, that's good. So we kind of briefly touched upon the nature of man and the important uh, point of diversions between the LDS and Church of Jesus Christ traditions, i.e. only Jesus personally pre-existed and of course that has ramifications but when it comes to say the nature of man of course like uh, an after the fall um like the day saints would view although we do have a very positive view of man in compared to say augustinian christianity and so forth uh we still believe as a result of the fall we're still fallen morally and epistemologically i.e how we know things you know we're not brand pelagians and of course we have to be redeemed um but uh so what would the nature of man be in your tradition um of course uh and also what's the nature of the hereafter you know and what's what are the promises of a glorified christian you know is it an exalted celestial earth is it like heaven going and also i know this is like a multi-tier question so take as long as you want what do you do <laughs> in section 76 of the doctrine Covenants that speaks of three tiers if you will because as you know yeah. like there of course like i know you don't believe all the revelations Cindy was a part of or binding or even necessarily right. true, you know, right. and maybe that's one of them that, you know, maybe you could explain true. If it's you one do of them. or don't yeah. believe it. And, you know, um, maybe if you were to say like nature, man, the intermediate state, not heaven and hell, but the intermediate state, is there an intermediate state who goes there and so forth. And maybe like heaven and hell. And also like, maybe I know this is going long, but like take as long as you want. What about those who never heard the gospel? Or what about those who die before the age of reason? If you were to address those issues as well, because I'm sure many people will be wondering about your take on these topics there. Because, you know, one of these selling points, I hate using that term for lack of a term, selling points of LDS theology is like we do have definitive answers about what about those who never heard the gospel? What about who die before the age of reason? So how would you yeah. approach those um, topics? Because even on the pastoral level, and I know you're very active on the pastoral level, those issues yes. are bound to have come up for better or yeah. worse. So maybe if you were to address those topics, I know I've asked quite a bit, so take as long as you want. I, I feel like this this has been like, uh, you're the pitcher in the home run derby that that throws it, but then the expectation is for me to be the batter at the home run derby and just knock it like 500 feet out of the park. But the, you know, but they're not, I mean, I mean, and you certainly gave me these, you know, several of these in advance. So it's not like, I mean, they're not out of the blue questions. My point is, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to knock every single thing out of the park or how, how we're doing here, but it, this it, is a it, big it, question. It's, it's, it's fine. It's fine. Th this is a big question with a lot of pieces to and it. And by, by the way, for lo uh, I know you know this, but for those listening, uh, I did submit these questions. So these are not gotcha questions. And I know some of these are like uh, complex yeah, questions. Yeah. So if you need a nuanced things, uh, take as long as you want. And even if there's no definitive answers in your tradition, that's fine. It's just, as I stated before, and I know you know this, this is just for listeners, these are questions that will inevitably come up and might as well have a resource where they're addressed in some way. Yeah, yeah. Well, when regarding the fall, I, I'm drawn to the verse of Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. And I love the fact that even though mankind sinned, and when they sinned and disobeyed, uh, sin entered the world that, and even though by the cost of one, we all have the natural consequence of death, we read this in Genesis, we 
read the fall throughout the Book of Mormon being discussed, that when the Book of Mormon does it, it, it explains that from the foundation of the world, the plan was always Christ. From the foundation of the world, the plan was always, plan B was not Jesus. Plan A was Jesus. The fall happened. Man sinned. I don't want to, that's my simple way of looking at it, is the fall is man sinned. And when they sinned, we messed everything up. And we mess things up today. Guess what? We're not exempt from that. But we see such a hope in the Book of Mormon. Adam fell that men might be. Men are that they might have joy. And you go on to the next verse. It's all about the Lord. It's all about the coming of the Messiah. So it it's always been plan A for the Lord to offer redemption to his creation. But we all sin and fall short. So that's the simple way that I would view the fall. Adam fell. Yes, we sin today. Yes, we're in a world today that is a consequence of the fall. We are not in Eden today. You know, we are in that that consequence. There is death. There is uh, the looming judgment to come because we fall short. And so we have a responsibility before the Lord to proclaim his name. And, you know, when you start talking about those that have never heard, let me, let me try and parse this out by talking about some of the things first. I'll get there. And if I forget where I'm at, just circle me back. But yeah, Alma 40, I think is very clear. That when we die, our spirits, no matter who we are, are brought before God. And we are in a state then of either paradise or outer darkness. That's what's being described there in that chapter. And we're all looking forward to life after life after death. I like the way N.T. Wright actually words that. Okay, even though I don't agree with everything N.T. Wright writes, I like the way he words it. We're we're not looking forward to life after death. We're really looking forward to life after life after death. Yeah, you know, it, he's N.T. Wright, and he's not. He's often not N.T. Wrong, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I'm probably N.T. Wrong, so it's okay. But uh, you know, so we believe that when we die we are we take alma 40 that's our go to chapter on this paradise or outer darkness based on the condition of your the state of your soul when you die and you're brought before uh the lord at the time you know waiting for the anticipation and the the judgment to come i i think that there is a a judgment and an eternity that awaits us so when i'm uh, looking at this, uh, I'm going to pull up a couple scriptures that I have on this relevant to the question. But uh, so if you bear with me just for a second. So there's a time coming when we all stand before God and we'll know the truth. Okay, so I like Mosiah 3. 20 and 21. It says, Moreover, I say unto you that the time shall come when the knowledge of the Savior shall spread throughout every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And behold, when that time cometh, none shall be found blameless before God except to be little children, only through repentance and faith on the name of the Lord Omnipotent. King Benjamin uh, wants to be found blameless. And later on in some of the later verses, he says that he's sharing the testimony of Christ so that he will be blameless because he's sharing the knowledge that he has to those that he's preaching to that day. So I view the church as the kingdom of God on earth and that I have the authority to bring people into the kingdom of God on earth through the message, through the preaching of the message of the gospel, through those that hear that message to take action of repentance and baptism, and through that, that I would have authority to lay on hands for reception of the Holy Ghost. And with, when we endure to the end, we will all one day, believing and unbelieving, stand before God to be judged. That's one of the core principles of the gospel of Christ is the judgment to stand before Christ one day 
as he is the just judge. And we'll stand before him to be judged according to our works, as the, the scripture says. Now, what lies beyond that, I believe, is the beautiful e eternity that awaits. You know, we can read verses throughout the Book of Mormon that talks about an endless lake of fire um, when it describes hell. And it describes an endless judgment of the wicked that are cast away, an eternal torment. You know, those things I take very literally when I read them, that that is something that nobody likes to talk about. I don't care what but, church but, you're but in. But you would affirm um, a form of, to use a fancy term, eternal conscious torment. Yes. Okay. Yes. That we all resurrect, believing or unbelieving, and stand before Christ to be judged. And there's eternal torment for those that are judged wicked at that day. And uh, and then the, the Book of Mormon describes the fact that we dwell forever with Christ and with God. That is also prevalent throughout the Book of Mormon on multiple occasions, where it talks about us dwelling with the Lord for all eternity. And so with that, that's our hope of heaven, is to dwell with God forever. And um, that's our understanding of heaven. So for us, there is not uh, three levels to that. Um, to us, you are uh, judged to one of those two places. May the Lord save us all in his kingdom. Okay, it's, it's I, I thank God that I'm not the judge. And then the question that, um, besides you, Robert, I believe every branch of Christianity does struggle with, it, and I agree that the LDS answered this. They have an answer to this, that most Christians would struggle on this answer is what about those that don't know? I find it interesting, the words of King Benjamin there to talk about being blameless by preaching it and also being then an intimation that there might be those who were then blameless for not hearing it. And how that gets parsed out is probably something where I'm thankful I'm not the judge. I do understand your interpretation. I, well, I, when I say that, I say that humbly. I believe I understand your interpretation for the need for temples and for baptism by proxy and some of those Which, things. Which, by the way, is a question we'll be addressing because it relates to this, but yeah. It does directly relate to this question because that ultimately is your very defined answer. We, we don't see that as necessary. We don't necessarily uh, see enough evidence in Corinthians there. I, I understand you've written on the topic. I under, I've even read some of it. I think it's good content, Thank you. you know, um, but I, I don't necessarily, we don't necessarily see baptism by proxy as something necessary for, as is stated in the Book of Mormon, this probationary state. And the reason for it is we see, I, I guess this is an argument from absence. So, you know, forgive me of that, but it, it's just not something we see much. It, you have one verse there in Corinthians. It's there. You know, I, I'm not saying I have, you know, the perfect answer to that, but we don't see it in Acts. We don't see it in the actions of the church. We see it there in the letter in a way that has disputed interpretation, depending on who's talking about it. But where we don't see it is in the actions of the church in Third Nephi, we don't see it in the actions of the Church of Acts or or Christ instructing it or or some of, some of that unfolding, and so for us, there's just not enough there for that to be the answer for us. So we don't have temples per se. We're not answering the question that way. We're probably answering it in a very simple way. Of Christ is the judge, I have a responsibility to share the message. If I don't share the message in Mosiah, there clearly, King Mo King Benjamin was willing to take the what believed he would take the brunt of it if he did not share uh, the the truth of the message of the gospel of Christ and leave that to his hearers. I would hope that I take that burden just as serious and do my job. Uh, there might be parts and pieces I don't know there, but I, I pray I do my job in sharing the message of Christ. And for those that do hear, may the Lord, not through me, but through his Holy Spirit, prick their heart and allow them to render obedience unto his gospel, because there is no greater life we could live in this life and no greater life we could hope for than in the life to come. No, thanks for that. So um, 
But of course, like you would not hold to like say what we would say section seventy six like to three degrees. You would view that as, although I think it's historically incontrovertible, Sinny was a part of you all the reception. You would oh just yeah, say, you would yeah. Just say, no, he was. Yeah, it, it's still not binding because it contra- in your view it would contradict what's binding beforehand. So uh, correct, Ex- exactly right. Okay, yep. no, that's fair. that's fair, fairly said. Yeah, um, but would you still believe that like um like many traditions like would view like there's heaven or hell, there is that kind of binary, but even then there's like different gradients or levels, not like heavens, but like different gradients, if you will, of reward and punishment in the hereafter, like um, the 60, the 100, and the 30 fold, or different levels of crowns and so forth. Would that be a position that you would hold as well? Like, yes, like uh, there's a hell, it's a certain conscious torment, but like, say, a well-meaning um, charity activist atheist is not going to uh, suffer the same torments, if you will, as a Adolf Hitler, you know, that there would be still different gradients of punishment and also reward in heaven and hell. I I wouldn't say that I, I read that when I read the scriptures okay. in, in, in there being levels or gradients. And I would just say, personally, all I'm after is a penny to sure. go back to that scripture in the New Testament. I, I just want the penny, man. I want that, whether, you know, when you look at that parable and it, it was, you know, the, the servant that had been serving for so long and the servant that came in right at the end, everybody got a penny. I just want that penny. I, I, it, if there's levels, uh, I, I just want to be at the feet of Christ. Okay. I don't, uh, I just want to be with the Lord. That's all I want. Okay. And that's, no, I no, don't, that's yeah. No, no, that's fine. And by the way, Craig Blomberg, um, who's like, um, you probably have heard of him, like a leading New Testament scholar. He would actually hold that view that there, at least, in heaven anyway, not necessarily hell, but in heaven there's no gradients. It's it's one and the same for everyone. So um, yeah. at least you have some uh, scholarly support for that position, you know, so. <laughs> and whatever it is, I agree with the Apostle Paul. No eye hath seen, yeah. nor First ear Cor- hath heard, nor First entered into the heart. Two. Nine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, the things that God has prepared for those that love him, I think it's, it's going to be marvelous. No, that's fine. But when it, uh, when you were discussing, like, say, those who never heard, um, so it's an allowable position to uh, not necessarily be engaged in inclu- hold to inclusivism, but like like anti right and others, like the wider hope. Maybe like uh, people could be saved um, even if they're not like a confessing Christian, like maybe supernaturally or true ignorance, like Romans to the Gentiles who do God's law in their hearts. There is like um, an allowance for like a wider hope, but. Not necessarily like inclusivism or like, but yeah. there there is like say, who knows we leave it in God's hand. There is like an allowance for that kind of position. While all at the same time, of course, not negating the need that one must ordinarily anyway explicitly confess Christ as Lord and so forth. Well, I would, you know, here's where the scriptures, you, you're you drawing an interpretation, but I, I would just say this from that. We have a very wide hope that's beyond our, our walls. Okay, so we do not believe that the only people in heaven will be members of the Church of Jesus Christ. So first and foremost, while we believe we represent the kingdom of God on earth, we do not believe that we are the exclusive. While we do believe we are, we believe in sole authority. Okay, but that does not mean that we believe that we are the only ones that come in. Okay, we don't we don't believe that. So we believe there will be, and may there be everyone in the gates of heaven. When I read the scriptures, it does say every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess on that great last day. There's the only way to Christ, to to the fathers through the son. There's abundant evidence for that. It, you know, for the gentleman in Papua New Guinea who, who lives a life fearing God and never hears of Jesus Christ or from whatever century, you know, there's a lot there that I trust in God for and know that he'll He'll take care of that in his own way. I I believe that would be his job, not mine. Oh no, uh, yeah. So basically, yeah. anti rights view of the wider hope. But yeah, no, yeah, no, that's pretty popular. I mean, like if I wasn't LDS, I'd still hope that would be the case as well. So yeah, yeah. I have a wide hope. Yeah. I although I have a narrow view of how the scripture in interprets salvation. So, but I have a wide hope. Sure. Um, I think that raises a question. I was planning on asking this, uh, but uh, hopefully it's not a co- uh, won't be seen as a gotcha question. But no, how, you're fine. How, how would your church view the efficacy of, say, my baptism or the baptism of like um, other restorationist groups? Um, would it be a case like you would expect them to be rebaptized, but that's a question like say more like church membership, or would you view like all they were baptized externally 
it did not actually affect um, salvation because they're outside the Church of Jesus Christ. I hope does that make sense? No, it's a very good question. The answer is we you would be rebaptized. Okay, if you wanted to join, the offers open anytime, my brother. But I hey, I'm just teasing. Uh, Likewise, it, it's not a yeah. I yep. I hear you. Not a gotcha question at all. Our view on it is based on our view of the authority of the priesthood. Okay. And so through that, you know, we would recognize that we are the officiants of the ordinances of Christ. And because we have a sole authority perspective on that, we would expect rebaptism just like in Acts chapter 19. And for just, those that have like, been baptized like by John, would, if you would do the same that. thing yeah. to me. So, yeah. so it's based on a view of soul authority. It is not me saying your baptism wasn't personal and real and sure. effectual for you. It, it's me stating that we have the authority to administer the ordinances of Christ. And in recognition of the church and that authority, you would come in under that entry point because that's always the entry point. And in Acts 19 is probably the key scripture for that, that we would both use when talking to somebody that is coming into the church, whether yours or mine. So, yeah. And so basically you would hold to a view more or less similar to ours. You know, it's like, you know, you know, I'm sure your baptism was very personal. It's just like, if you were to, hopefully one day you will cross it uh, and make that jump, you know, and I'm sure you hope the same for me, but like, exactly. You know, yeah. So it's not, it's not uh, personally offensive. It's just like, you know, days the rules if you will but no so it would be very uh lds if you will um approach to rebaptism and so forth so no that's fine uh so it's actually a point of um conversions as opposed to a point of diversions yeah um and when it comes to say heaven um like there's some views that, like say um there'll there'll be a marriage between heaven and earth so like earth will be part of heaven you know um would that be your view or would you view like uh heaven going if you will, ease heaven, like you'll be uh, transposed, if you will, to a new dimension, uh, if that makes sense. Yeah, so we are people that believe in a millennial. So we we believe in Zion to come in the flesh before Christ's return in its fullness of the kingdom. And at the and that is like, you know, we almost view like the restoration as the betrothal of the church back to Christ. And that one day he will return to wed his bride. And when that happens, the millennial and the new heaven and new earth that takes place is like the wedding feast for a thousand years. And after that, there is judgment and glory and heaven. And whether that is taking place in the millennial type new heaven and new earth or how exactly that plays out. I just want to be there. I'm good gotcha. with that. I think there's different ways to read those scriptures. I think we have a at least with our only accepting Bible and Book of Mormon, there's a limited number of scriptures to go on for the life after life after death. That's sure. for sure. We would certainly, but things you would, like, you, yeah. But you, but you would be like classical pre-millennialist, like LDS would be like, um, yes. There'll, there'll be yes. a real 1,000 year millennium uh, when Christ returns and after that, like new heavens and new earth and so forth. So, yeah. So there's, for us, the pre-millennial, we would call Zion, Okay, often and we or the peaceful reign. Uh, yeah, and, that's that's the yeah. one, LDS nomenclature as well. Yeah, yeah. And Christ comes at the end of that. Time is shortened for the elect's sake. He returns. Um I, I think there's evidence in Revelation and terminology of that being termed then a new heaven and new earth, you know, the holy city coming down, dwelling with Christ for a thousand years, and then after that the resurrect second resurrection. So you, you have the resurrection of the righteous at Christ's return, and then you have a, a second resurrection. At that second resurrection, we all stand before God to be judged and then enter into the eternity that awaits us. So. No, 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 that's perfect. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, I appreciate it. And of course, like uh, when it comes to the, the nature of man, you would view like um, what would happen is like a um, perfect, you would be perfectly sanctified and you would be glorified. Um, that would be like, say, the result of one being redeemed fully, you know, um, a very traditional Christian perspective, um, not to engage in guilt by association, yeah. but that would be like no, it's very, very traditional. A la Daniel, yes. you know, being white and uh, sanctified, uh, that kind of sense. Yep, yep, yeah. absolutely. Cool. Yep. 
Uh, we're we're near the end. We only have like uh, three issues, but um, when it comes to is a worship on a typical Sunday, you kind of touch upon like uh, there is like okay, an yeah. allowance for like say um, speaking in tongues and so forth. But like say on a uh, typical Sunday meeting, maybe if you were to like outline what that is, you know, uh, we use the same sacrament prayers that we would use, albeit you would use the uh, original wine as opposed to water. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, like the common cup, would it be like um, would the Eucharistic prayers be the same? Are you taken from the Book of Mormon? Uh, what would be like, say, the standard uh, to use a fancy term, liturgy, if you will? Like, um, are the yeah. are the talks after the sacrament? You know, um, what's the role of hymnody in the tradition as well? There's kind of the tradition of how we do things, but there's a lot of flexibility within that. So, if the ministry feels to do something on a certain day, it you know it, it and it goes in that direction. Praise God, you know, follow the Spirit, brothers. So. You know, but typically, you know, we'll have a Sunday school in the morning and after Sunday school, we begin a worship service. We do a, we are a singing group. We do a lot of singing. You know, my congregation, half half of them are, are from Africa. So there's a lot of clapping. There's a lot of uh, joyful noises that we make in, in praising God. And we have preaching. Um, we have testimonies every week and we have, a, you know, a, uh, you know, if anybody's sick and needs prayer or anointed, uh, those things are, are offered to take place. And we have the Lord's Supper. Uh, once a quarter, we practice feet washing with the entire congregation. You know, in John chapter 13, the Lord, the same night that he gives communion, the Lord instructs for feet washing. He doesn't tell us how often, but he instructs it. And so we are, uh, one, we usually about once a quarter, we just had ours last Sunday, uh, all of the brothers will wash the brother's feet. When you do, you're humbling yourself before your brother, praying for them while you're washing their feet and asking the Lord's blessing to be in their life and however the Lord directs you in those prayers. One of the beauties of it is you'll see the president of the church kneeling before a newly baptized member and everybody's equal. And it's one of the best things about the ordinance. It's a very humbling, intimate ordinance to have with our brothers and sisters. The sisters wash each other's feet just for propriety just to you know uh to make sure that there's you know sisters wash it's just the right thing to do just sisters wash sisters feet brothers wash brothers feet uh so that's something special you'll see in our congregations around the world once a quarter um and often there's if there's more than one elder you might have more than one speaker you might have a speaker and somebody that follows or something like that during the preaching uh testimonies are are pretty free flowing and encouraged and that would be a, a basic structure. Um, you know, midweek services are all over the map. I mean, we do a teens class, uh, our young men's class out at my place. Usually it involves a bonfire, scripture, deep topics, you know, uh, diving into topics that might be relevant for young people. You know, we have an active ladies circle that meet together around the church. It's, it's um, you know, for the women and for our young sisters. Uh, there's a, a lot of auxiliary stuff for the youth. Uh, retreats, things like that that go on. But I know you were specifically asking about a Sunday. That's that's the typical Sunday. Um, plenty of congregations will have a big meal afterwards. We are a group that likes to be together, that enjoys the fellowship of it. We're, you know, we're a group that wherever you go, you stay at somebody's house, you know, hotels happen, but man, more often you'll see, you know, 10 kids piled on a floor, as they're traveling somewhere and everybody's just together. Uh, we love being together. Uh, the, the bond of fellowship is, is definitely a, a strength of the church. It, it's a real, it's an act. It's a very much so uh, a, a, the word community is overused, but that it's a community feel. It's, it's a very intimate place uh, for, for our, our membership. And even when you're traveling across the country and you don't know a brother or sister, you could easily stay at their home and that would be open and welcomed. And it's just, uh, it's one of the neat things about the church. We have unique songs. We certainly sing restoration songs. We will sing amazing grace, but we have uh, through one of our sisters that received the gift of song, just like uh, David, the psalmist and others in the scriptures, Nephi, when he writes his scripture, we have an entire hymn book that was inspired by one of our sisters where she wasn't gifted or talented at all. But she receives both the music she received. She's recently passed away, both the music and the words completely. 
and actually needed talent around her for composition because she had no singing skills or musical skills, but the Lord gave her the gift of songs. And uh, so we we have an entire hymnal called the Songs of Zion that we uh, sing from. And so that's just, that's some of the, the different, you will hear around the world Songs of Zion being sung on a Sunday at our congregation. It's just one of our hymn books. So. Oh, that's good. Uh, just on the, um, you mentioned you have a Sunday school every Sunday, like in the LDS tradition, like, um, you know, there's a four year cycle at the moment, like one year Old Testament, next year New Testament, then Book of Mormon, then Doctrine and Covenants, church history. Um, and all units of the church follow the same um, week by, by week, the uh, various passages. Uh, so there's a uniformity, if you will, there. Is there like one, a uniformity of like what's to be uh, discussed or taught in the uh, gospel doctrine classes throughout and if so is there some type of cycle uh, if you will like a, is there like one year old testament or bible and next year book of mormon uh uh so if you want to uh, maybe address that yeah. just, i'm just kind of curious i i see the value in that i i actually you know my my mother-in-law is catholic i know they have their set readings and some of their set studies as well and you know, in some things, it's it's kind of preset that way for her, and and it's wonderful. It's a unifying thing to do. We do not do that. We are very. Uh, we have lessons that the church does have an education committee that creates lessons. They can or don't have to be used. I I don't always use them when I teach my lessons. In fact, very rarely. So, our our ministry, our teachers, those that are teaching the children, they that would be more determined from the congr from the branch side what what series they want to teach what they want to go through what the planning is for that very open so it's it's not something that's preset is the a short answer but i actually i really respect it i understand why i i see the value in in having the, the pros, unity the, of yeah, that there, there's yeah. pros and cons to both yeah um, yeah but um when it comes to say donations of course like lds at the moment practice like tithing and so forth um is there a form of donation uh, that uh, members of your community engage in? Is it tithing or is it some or is it like um, more like voluntary contributions, but it's not necessarily strict 10% tithing? Yeah, it's voluntary. We call it free will tithing, but it's voluntary. There is there is no set amount for anybody. It is completely up to the individual. We encourage a tithe. We encourage a 10% donation. Frankly, we don't. You know, uh, I mean, I do, but frankly, we don't. I mean, it, it, if we did, we'd have more money in the bank. So, um, you know, but our books are completely open. Every asset of the church is available to see by every member. And our, and it's published in the financial report of our conference minutes. How money is being spent at every level of the church is open and available to every member of their branch for what the branch is spending for a region, for what the region is spending, and for the general church. So there's complete transparency on our finances, and donations are, are free will, freely, free will. No, uh, that's fine. And, uh, of course, like, when it comes to, say, the uh, sacrament or the Eucharist, whatever nomenclature one wants to use, of course, like, y you practice it weekly, you have the common cup, and, of course, you use the uh, bread and wine. And I shouldn't note, of, of course, like, um, the... LDS used to do that until like the turn of the 20th century. And of course, like the word of wisdom uh, was not strictly adhered to or uh, commanded until the um, Heber J. Grant's presidency. Um, that's why like last time you had a coffee and um, maybe yeah. next time you'll have a Guinness uh, because I can drink, but I'm Irish. So, you know, can make up. Cheers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, joking aside, um, when it comes to say, the Eucharist or the sacrament, whatever term um, is used in your, um, uh, or communion or whatever, um, is there any developed theology or is there any distinctives between your understanding of the Eucharist beyond like say using wine and the common cup than say the LDS or other restorationist understandings of the Eucharist or would it be pretty similar in terms of say its effect, its purpose and its theology, like the, pre uh, the issue of presence and so forth? Yeah. And I just realized I didn't answer everything you asked about that earlier. I'm sorry. Sometimes I went down a tangent. But oh, we, no, it's, we, it's fine. It's fine. Yeah. We don't say the Moroni prayer verbatim to circle back. Okay. You asked that. I'm sorry. Uh, we, it's a template. Okay. We, it certainly is the example. You'll hear reflections in it, in our prayers and our ministry will always offer that blessing, but it's not said word for word. Okay. So that's just one thing that's maybe, un I think, from what I've seen, very unique about us that we don't say those verbatim. Um, so, so, just, just on that, um, 
What yeah. About, like, uh, if someone jump to offer a prayer, as long as it substantially touches upon, like, say, what has to be said, like, um, maybe, uh, for instance, like in uh, some, say, Catholic sacramental theology, there's like uh, the essential form. Uh, you have to say, uh, this is my body, this is my blood, to confect it. Would it be like um, something similar in your tradition? Like, you must at least touch upon something essential, and that's fine. It doesn't have to be like um, similar to Moronite's prayer. Yeah. For the ministry, you need to bless the bread and you need to bless the wine in the name of the Lord, you know, but uh, the, the rest of it is is not necessarily that. I would say even even the Catholic might be a little bit more developed than us there. It, it's a little bit more open and more free. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, to be fair, I just it, It's kind know, of a reflection of, you'll see this kind of a reflection of who we are. You know, it's like we're very, you know, desiring to be led by the spirit and all these things is very little repetition in that way. I mean, there's things we do, but it's very open to that. It's very flexible there, but, but the bread gets blessed, you know, don't make no, make no oh, mistake yeah, course, about it in the name of the Lord. Yeah. So, um, and I, I think it's good for us to challenge ourselves to use the Moroni scriptures to make sure we're hitting the points that he hits on. That's, that's certainly important. Um, and then, you know, for your, uh, give me, give me your your basic question about communion again, though. That started that. Oh um, yeah, um, of course. Like that I, jugged I, my memory. Oh yeah, of course. Like there's like some differences, like uh, like say using wine as opposed to water, and um, yeah. some other changes, which are not really substantial changes. I think anyway. But when it comes to say the theology of say the Eucharist or the communion or sacrament, yeah. however you want to label it, uh, would the theology and the purpose, if you will, like uh, the effect and so forth of the sacrament or the Eucharist would, uh, would the LDS trad understanding of it and like say the church of Jesus Christ, would there be like no real major point of this, uh, distinction or divergence when it comes to say the theology, the doctrine of it? Yeah. We would just take the scriptures that says it represents the body and it represents the blood. And that's, that's our position. Okay. We don't sure. believe in transubstantiation or substitution or things like that. It's, you know, for us, it's it's a representation of the Lord. It's a reminder of our covenant to him. It's a reminder of his sacrifice to us. And it brings us together in one body under him. And that's that's the basics of it. It's it's representing sure. something that we are to remember. Yeah, and uh, we would hold that view as well. Uh, yeah. But um, in, in the LDS tradition, and it's going to be um, stressed a lot in recent decades, he's like, God can use it as a means of bringing about, say, sanctification and renewing our covenants. Would there be something similar in your tradition as well that it's not simply like a symbol, like the Zeranglian view, but God can use it positively as well, like, say, to sanctify someone or use it as some other positive means as well beyond a mere physiological reminder of the atonement? Hmm, that's a good question. I don't know if I have... The, the perfect answer there to that. I, I think there can be incredible meanings and experiences that come through communion would be a maybe a less formal way for me to answer that. I mean, there's been times where people have had powerful experiences tied to it and it has directed them in powerful ways. So I, I, I think uh, there's something to that that maybe I haven't fleshed out in my answers, but Okay, no, that's fine. Um, I appreciate the answers. Um, and I didn't know about the, uh, for lack of a term, flexibility when it comes to the uh, sacrament prayer in your tradition. So, um, you know, I I'm learning new things as well, so I do appreciate yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so, like, um, there's two other questions left before, like, I, uh, unless, of course, you want to address other things as well. And, like, one other thing that comes up is, of course, we address temples, we address baptism from the dead, albeit briefly, and your rationale for not having temples and practicing baptism from the dead. Uh, now, What's your theology of marriage? Now, let me preface this by saying one of the things that really irks me about like how LDS approach non-LDS traditions is the view that non-LDS traditions have a really poor view of marriage or it's dead to you person, that's like tragedy. And well, I do affirm like what LDS theology teaches about marriage, it kind of irks me whenever we have this kind of, um, everyone else has this very low view of marriage. So I'm not trying to like um, have a gotcha here. Yeah, but, different is not low, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, of course, like you would not hold to say temple marriage, of course, because you don't practice, have practice Correct. temple worship and so forth. Yeah, but there's no endowments so, for yeah, us, none exactly. of those things. Yeah. But when it comes to say the theology of marriage, of course, I'm sure you, I know you're married and um, 
your wife seems awesome and so, uh, so forth. So um, she is awesome. Oh, yeah, there you go. I make sure she listens to this now. I'm not sure she'll make it through two and a half hours of this, but she's awesome. She is awesome. It, it, it's a two hour 30 minute mark. There. <laughs> uh, but she sees me all the time. Yeah. She doesn't but, need to watch. Me. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. But um, not, I'm saying like you have, uh, you may have a lower view of marriage because we have believe in eternal marriage, but what would your view right. of marriage be like? Um, you know, when it comes to divorce and remarriage, you know, that I know that's a controversial issue uh, amongst many groups. Um, oh, no, it's a good but, question. Um, and I'm not even like suggesting like say sex or anything like that in the hereafter, but would I believe that there are the marriage bonds in the hereafter, even if there's no, uh, or would that be like the traditional Christian view um, that they're resolved at death? W traditional. Yeah. Okay. So we would, you know, I know we have a different interpretation of Matthew 22 there. We would interpret that very traditionally that there is no marriage in the hereafter. Um, but for me to make the pitch of how high we view marriage just for a moment, even though it's different in, in what we think takes place later, we ultimately believe that this is just a reflection of what's to come. And what I mean by that is the glory of Christ as the groom married to the church as the bride and that ultimate union and the wedding feast that follows, that's that's everything. If my marriage has good moments at all, and if there's intimate moments at all that can be celebrated in that hope and, and even give me a taste of the glory that might be ahead, that is marvelous in my eyes. And so with for us, it might be representing something to come, but that representation is very high to us, very potent and powerful. And the value of our little church in God's eyes to us and hit the value of him coming down and that ultimate one day uniting of the kingdom of on earth with his, that union, that glory is just beyond expression. So, so how highly we would view that would be uh, bar none. And yes, my marriage is a is a in some small natural way a reminder and a reflection of that unity that can can come later. So would it be fair to say, just like uh, maybe to use another example, just to say the Old Testament sacrifices in the temple were a type or a shadow of like yes, an anti yes, like a type atonement. is the right word. You, yeah, you would view marriage now like the union, the love, the uh, uh, self-sacrifice and so forth. The intimacy, type, all of it. If you yeah. will, of the union of the believer with Christ when he comes and the marriage feast and so forth. You know, it has this kind of a typological function as well as other functions, but a yeah. Christological, typological function, if you will. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. And uh, yeah. would your church actually have any uh, perspectives on the issue of divorce and remarriage? Because like when like the, uh, when the 19th century groups, not just when yeah. uh, the LDS restorationist tradition, even the Campbellites and Infants Rigdon, they, there was like varying degrees of like say allowance for of divorce and remarriage. Some groups when the, you not the, the Mormon, but the American restorationist movement had a guilt by association. If you communed with someone who was divorced or the family member of someone who was divorced, you're exed, you know, now, I, I doubt you're that strict, but like uh, when it comes to say divorce and remarriage, um, is there like a, um, and of course I know this is like a tricky position, but this is no, a no, it's... position as well. So yeah, what, what's the perspective or allowable perspectives, I should say, when you're traditional when it comes to, of course, divorce and remarriage? Divorce and remarriage is allowed. Um, that is new. And what I mean by that is that is new as of like the late 80s or very, very early 90s. There was a long time when it wasn't allowed at all uh, in our background. So there's part of our past that it's like, well, and I think overwhelmingly, we probably recognize that it, it's not perfect. We haven't perfectly fleshed this out. Okay. It is allowed. It's it's restricted. Okay. You can't just do it without. Um, uh, just cause. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you. you um, I cannot, but we take the vow very seriously and sacred. Okay. So, um, and we're disheartened when that's not the case, even within the church as a, as a ministry, we take it very seriously and sacred, but uh, it is allowed and there's reasons and, and, you know, causes that, that are justified, you know, abuse, adultery, you know, things like that, that can happen that, 
for the safety of the individual or, you know, when uh, a covenant has been clearly broken by abandonment or uh, adultery or, or something like that, um, addiction, that that there can be uh, just causes for, for divorce. Uh, it's not something we like. It's icky. We take our covenant tremendously seriously. It, it, it would be seen so as a necessary evil, if you will. Yeah, exactly. Almost like, you know, when the Lord says that I give that, you know, I give you the bill of divorcement, he does, still doesn't speak very favorably about it, even when he says it, right? So it's like, and and we would certainly feel the same way. We do believe in marriage to be between a man and a woman. Um, and uh, this, very... this kind of leads on to the next uh, issue when it yeah. gets moral issues, but that's good. Um, yeah, so that, that's, where, that's where we're at. Yeah, it's, we're very... Um, I don't like the word conservative that way because you don't have to be conservative to be in our church. But we, as far as marriage goes, it's between a man and a woman, and we yeah. believe that to be holy and and sanctified in the the way it's set up in Scripture and God's plan for our life. Uh, somebody certainly can be homosexual and be in our congregation as long as and, not practicing. Exactly. I know that's a difficult topic. It's hard for some people that, to. Uh, accept that as being the position, but I waited 27 years to have sex with my wife and she was worth the wait and it was God's plan for me. So, you know, we, we don't mind encouraging abstinence before marriage. And if you happen to be uh, attracted to members of the opposite sex or bisexual or whatever, we're not saying you weren't born that way. We're not saying that you didn't have, don't have feelings. Those feelings are real and that can be a real struggle we do believe there's healing in the Lord and there's a, a, a great plan and a picture for somebody's life under his set plan for us, not our plan for ourselves. Uh, yeah. And that kind of leads on to the uh, question of like uh, the church's stance on moral issues. Now, um, yeah. this is not a gotcha because like anyone who pays attention no. to my blog knows I'm very conservative. Hashtag abortion is murder. So no one will think I'm trying to like uh, get up here on Josh. Uh, but when it comes no, to- No, you're uh, okay. Oh, no, it's fine. I was just like- um, these are hot button topics, so like I would, uh, but anyone who pays attention to me knows I'm on the right side, uh, if you will, of these things. <laughs> <laughs> Double entendre intended. I, but, I heard it. I heard uh, it. Yeah. I heard the tone. Yeah. But um, so when it comes to say some of these moral issues, I'll might I just throw them out, and you can uh, you've already briefly touched upon them, but maybe we could flesh yeah. one or two out as well. So like, you're fine. Um, is there, uh, when it comes to the contraception weighing marriage, of course, like premarital sex is sinful. I think we can both agree. Uh, but does the church actually have any stance on the issue of contraception? Or is that simply um, between the spouses as long as it's consensual? Or would it be like a um, more traditional conservative view, like even when marriage contraception is a no-no? No, we, we there's no stance on contraceptions between the couples. Uh, the church doesn't uh, take a position on that. And if, if you know, yeah, the church is not as strict on that at all. Okay. Not at all. There's no position. So. Okay, no, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of comes off to the issue, and we kind of briefly touched upon the uh, beginning, but like, uh, again, hop on topic, but like um, the issue of abortion. Now, um, the LDS tradition would allow, it would view like abortion intrinsically as evil, but like in very, 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 very extremely rare cases. And they're, although like liberals, and when I use the term liberal, I mean like leftists, tend to like um use this as a um the trump card if you will but they're very rare uh like in the case of rape and incest and so forth it's allowable but even then doesn't mean ipso facto you should get an abortion it's just like it's allowable if you will uh what's the uh what's your church's stance on abortion uh or as i call it infanticide uh so you know where i'm coming from and is there uh of course, like you're pro-life, but like um, I know that, but maybe the church's stance on that as well. I'm sure hopefully it is also pro-life, but is there any allowable exceptions? You know, what's the view on abortion? Um, basically? Yeah. And so what a what a hot topic today. And, and if there's any young people that are, are caught in this that are, are watching, you know, I just encourage you because I'm going to answer with a little bit of scripture. And I recognize just how difficult of a topic this is and just how heated our world is today on this. But consider this, everybody. Consider the fact that Elizabeth sees Mary, and when she does, John is acknowledged and personified in the scripture, credited with actions that stir the Holy Spirit, and is, is, is treated as a human being, and Christ within the womb of Mary in that moment is treated 
as a living being with value. So according to the word of God, the baby that is alive within the womb is a living soul, okay? Just as it's described when God breathes into Adam and he became a living soul, that child is certainly a living soul. So our, our church is pro-life based upon the value that's offered within the word of God, because everything we believe in even if you want to interpret something differently, we're going to defend it with multiple scriptures within the Bible and Book of Mormon. And so that baby, John the baby, was alive, was a real person, and had intrinsic value at that time. And his actions at that time could even stir the Holy Spirit in the room. So the Bible is unquestionably pro-life. And our church is unquestionably pro-life. Now, like your church, my church does, has a strong, extremely strong chance, stance against abortion. But for women who take that stance, that there is room in the pew for you. There is healing through Christ. There is a mourning and a grief that the Holy Spirit can offer and come in and be with somebody that goes through those trials so that so for women that have made a decision that maybe the church might disagree with there's a place in the pew for you there's healing there's repentance there's peace that can be offered and found in the gospel and so that's the i mean even within that people that might make a decision you know that doesn't mean that you can't come to Christ and find him and find the peace that's offered through him. And, you know, uh, there are certainly exceptions there that the church accommodates as well, although strongly discouraged. So, yeah. Yeah. And, very uh, similar. It's uh, it's very similar. Oh, yeah. And uh, let me just, uh, in spite of whatever theological differences we have, I do appreciate like uh, this being shared. Um, unfortunately, so many of my tradition uh, are becoming more improvised. It's it's revolting, frankly. So I'm looking forward to having Nathaniel on uh, to discuss the LDS perspective and why being pro-life is the only sane option. But uh, when it comes to St. John the Baptist, that's an excellent text to use because it shows he's sentient. You know, he's not like a clump of cells uh, that still has to be a person. But you might appreciate this. Uh, I know you don't accept this as a revelation, but in sec well, yeah, section no, okay. 4 of the Doctrine and Covenants in verse 28, um, it, the current printing has John the Baptist being baptized in his youth, but the original handwritten text actually has him being baptized in his mother's womb. So, mm. and based on this, I do think like that 1832 revelation in light of, say, Jeremiah 1, 5, you know, the sanctification of Jeremiah and also the sanctification of John the Baptist, um, that that's what it's referring to, like a uh, extraordinary baptism of John the Baptist when uh, Elizabeth meets uh, Mary. But um, yeah, like even in uniquely LDS scriptures, uh, there's this kind of um, John the Baptist was a person because if he was baptized in his mother's womb and you can only baptize uh, persons, um, what you're dealing with here is not a clump of cells uh, until they uh, pop out of their mother, like a uh, certain um, party in the U.S. Uh, wants you to believe. Um, but enough about that. But uh, yeah. Uh, I well, and we would we would unite around Jeremiah one five as yeah. being a, a important scripture in this discussion. You and, know, and, and for those who are wondering, uh, it's um, bef uh, I, how before that before the yeah. I knew the and uh, sanctified the and so forth. So um, you can only do these actions to a person. So uh, yeah. Um, but no, that's good. Um, so that's kind of a. Uh, that's contraception, that's abortion, that's divorce and remarriage that we've touched upon. And of course, like when it comes to say the issue of say, um, you kind of briefly touched upon it, like uh, the issue of uh, homosexuality, um, it would be viewed as uh, homosexual behavior itself. The behavior itself is sinful, but in of itself, having like homosexual tendencies, but not acting to punish, um, that would not be seen as necessarily evil. As long as one, like, um, because we all have sinful temptations and so forth, you know, some are more grievous than others, but that would be uh, the perspective of your church as well. Like, homosexual behavior is intrinsically sinful, but simply having an inclination but not acting to punish is not intrinsically sinful, but it's something to be uh, Correct. To God about and so forth, you know, so, similar to like the LDS view. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And of course, absolutely. Yeah. 
And of course, like the final hop on topic in our society today is the issue of transgenderism, which I think is crazy. It's, um, um, I don't know about you, but I think it's like trying to normalize a mental illness like bipolar. So at least you know where I'm standing on this. Like there's only two genders, but um, would your shirt sh actually, um, because it's like a new topic, I don't really expect, like say there be a developed theology of transgenderism, if you will, but you would hold the traditional view. There's only two genders. Uh, transgenderism is basically a uh, myth. It's not based on biology and so forth. Right. Yeah, right. Traditional gender isn't view. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. And so, again, uh, same thing. Somebody that has made some big decisions in their life in that environment. It's to be repented of. But there's a place happy. in the pew for that person, just as much as I thank God that there's a place in the pew for me. It is not <laughs> isolating. We all have to repent to come into Christ. It's the same path for us all in different ways. There's things that I suppress in my nature that I have tendencies towards that through the power of the Holy Spirit, it delivers me. So, you know, I, these are hard topics today, but it, of course. it you know, it doesn't mean that there aren't uh, Christ centered answers to them in the, in the word of God. So, and I actually do agree completely with that. So uh, we've covered, I think we've covered a lot. Uh, yeah. I think this is the uh, most comprehensive discussion, uh, at least outside of print, of the uh, so-called Bickernites of the Church of Jesus Christ. But, you know, we've discussed like scripture, we've discussed theology and practices, we've even discussed some moral issues. Uh, is there anything you want to address? Like uh, maybe um, we we not addressed like maybe um, a nuance or like some kind of doctrine or anything like that, or do we basically more or less covered the uh, gamut of what you would like to uh, discuss? No, this is this is great. Thanks for putting up with me. I know I oh, answer time. the questions as best I can. You've been a sport man because I know I know we hit on topics we disagree on, and you've just sat there and asked the next question. So, God bless you for that. That takes a, a certain spirit, Robert. So God bless you for that. I uh, I would just say one thing that is kind of unique about us: we are truly a volunteer organization. We are tent makers and carpenters. Okay, always have been. There is not a single paid member of our ministry. Uh, you know, I know uh, like one thing that might be different here is like, you know, general authorities, we don't have that title per se, but like our apostles are not paid. The president of our church is not paid. Everybody is working for the kingdom of God. They are all volunteers. You know, we don't view it even as volunteering. We take it so seriously. Like that word wouldn't even be said. But, but for lack of a better term, yeah. For lack of a better term, we're all volunteers. We're all giving to God for the good things he's done for us that we can never repay. So there's there's no paid ministry in our church. And that's something that's unique for us that I think is worthy of of mentioning. We're not the only ones, but it is unique to us in, in a certain respect. Um, we're uh, a simple church. I, I know that... I think at the end here, as somebody that's made it this far, you've learned that we haven't fleshed out every road of, of systematic theology. That's, that's not who we are. What we are strong in is in the workings of the Spirit of God and the gifts of the Spirit of God and the revelation of God to our membership, both on an individual level, at a branch level, and, and to the church. We have you talk about chiasmus in the Book of Mormon. We have revelations that have come forth free-flowing from members, detailed, intricate chiasms, beautiful words of the Lord, and prophecy for our day and time, marvelous gifts. So we have, uh, we're a, a small church with a big offering in the spirit. And, and through that, I, um, you know, as Robert invites me, I invite him and we have that tug of war and we smile and we both care a lot about where we stand. And I credit Robert for that. I credit him, uh, Robert, I credit you. I don't mean to speak in third person to you. I, I credit you for your, you know, valuing having this discussion enough to, to bring it out. And I may not have said things perfectly. I did the best I could. Where I have not said things perfectly, those were Josh's mistakes, not the church's. And we read those. I mean, I, I do Mormon and Moroni's plea there, right? I, I'm imperfect. I may not have said any, everything perfectly. Um, where I'm imperfect, those are my mistakes, not the Lord's. So. No, 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 and I do appreciate the uh, uh, the time you've uh, dedicated to this. Um, hopefully others will actually come to have a better appreciation of your tradition and actually have learned things. And even if they, like me, have uh, disagreed with you, at least still be pushed uh, to 
study maybe why they would disagree with you like the yeah, basis of the dead issue exactly you know so that's always good um of course like i'll be linking to your book which everyone should read it's actually a good book um witnessing miracles and i'll yeah. be addressed uh, i'll also link to the amazon page for that and your podcast page i'll also link to the official website of your group the church of jesus christ but um is there any other resource like either in print or online or what have you that you would maybe recommend to those who after listening to this, and if you braved the almost three hours, I commend yeah. you. Uh, Congratulations. You know, Kudos. Yeah. yeah. Of course, there's Daniel Stone's book uh, on yeah. William Bickerton. That was published by Signature, a very good book. Uh, it's been a few years since I read it, but it was very informative. So is there any other resource um, that you would recommend, you know, uh, for those who may want to uh, learn more about your group? Beyond, of course, the scriptures, which everyone should read anyway. Yeah. So, um yeah, so for the book, I appreciate the plug. I would just say, I think one thing I, I want to say is, and I think you're alluding to it by recommending it, is it's neutral, okay? You don't have to be a member of my church to uh, appreciate the contents of this book regarding the history and stuff. It's it's very straightforward that way. The topics we've discussed here are not the topics being discussed. So, you know, for somebody, I do believe the book cross pollinates around the restoration and frankly i believe it cross pollinates across the bigger umbrella of christianity i think anybody from a christ-centered background could read my my book and have things to study learn be challenged by or encouraged by in their faith as as that book goes on so it's it's i appreciate the plug and it's neutral it's not it's not a josh's church I mean, my church helped with the printing of it, but it's not a church. I didn't make any money from it. The money, the money all goes to Book of Mormon translation. I don't make a dime from it, but it's 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 all about the great miracles of Christianity, which for me is the resurrection and the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. I know we've talked about it before, so I don't mean to beat a dead horse by it, but it is neutral. Any branch of the restoration can enjoy the book. Episode 20, um, if someone wants a uh, TLDR version of the book, of course. Yeah, exactly right. And uh, as far as other materials, you know, actually we have a, a bookstore, a bookstore on our church website. The church is the church of Jesus Christ.org. I say the not to, with a double meaning, but just to circle that article is the only way you're going to get there. Okay. So, um, and, and as I said, I'll have the uh, link to the page yeah. of the official website on the uh, show notes as well. And in the bookstore section, like our second history book is excellent. You know, for some of the theological points, the dissertation on our faith and doctrine is excellent. Um, and, you know, a, a great book that's there, speaking of restoration and the need for restoration and apostasy was written by one of our late apostles, Truth Shall Spring Forth Out of the Earth. I, I believe that's on there. And it's all, you can download the PDFs all for free. Uh, so, those materials are all available. The, the second history book does a nice job covering some of the basics of what we've talked about today regarding Sidney Rigdon, William Bickerton, some of those things that get fleshed out. Some of those early parts are discussed there that really does a better job than I did today talking about the position of the church in, in those things. And it's it's not a cumbersome book. It's 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 a good read for a history book. It's a good read. No, that's good. Well, um, Josh, um, again, I do greatly appreciate your time, although we disagree. Hopefully it has been a cordial discussion and hopefully others will appreciate it. And I do appreciate the great work you've done on your book on the uh, Book of Mormon. It's like, in spite of our differences, at least we both recognize the importance, not simply of accepting the Book of Mormon, but the necessity of its historicity. And I really do like how you use the minimum facts theory for the resurrection as you did for the uh, Book of Mormon. And as I said, like episode 20 for like a um, good overview of uh, some of the points raised in the book, um, if it whets your appetite uh, before purchasing it. So, uh, Josh, uh, anything else you want to say before we wrap things up? No. Thanks, Robert. God bless you. God bless the podcast. Let it thrive and grow, man. And uh, hope to see you in the States uh, sooner rather than later. I'm hoping for the same as well. So if anyone has an in immigration, um, <laughs> please help me. But be that as it may, um, yeah, I appreciate it. And hopefully we can meet up in person either in Philadelphia or in Utah uh, in the near yeah. future. So that would be fun. But um, until then, uh, thanks for everyone for uh, what, uh, listening to the entire episode. Hopefully it has been informative. And if anything, even if you're LDS and disagree with what's been said by Josh, at least you'll have a greater appreciation of the other side, if you will, of the kind. 
and hopefully it will uh, push you into like engaging in more study to be more informed as to what you believe and why you would disagree, if you will, as opposed to like simply a visceral reaction, uh, if you will. But uh, until then, um, for everyone who listens to this, uh, take care and God bless.